Looking to improve your game? You can now sign up for CFB Pro using the promo code LVD, get access to articles and deck guides by the world's best. Hello and welcome to my Kaladesh Remastered set review. This set review will focus mainly on limited magic, so draft and sealed, but every now and then I might mention a constructed interaction as well. Now let me go over my rating system that I use for this set review. I use a letter grade system going from an F rating all the way to an S rating. The F grade is given to totally unplayable cards. These are often sideboard cards meant for constructed that should never make your limited decks. Then the D rating is given to bad filler cards that get cut more often than not, but every now and then if you're short on playables they might still make the deck, and sometimes sideboard cards also are given a D grade just because they're never going to make the main deck, but they could definitely make for serviceable sideboard cards if you're playing in best of three. Then the C rating is given to decent filler cards that sometimes get cut. The major bulk of the commons is going to fall in the C category. That's why I've also added the C plus category to diversify between a C and a C plus. And then in the C plus we've got good playables that almost never get cut. In this category you'll also find some more conditional removal spells. Then the B rating is given to great playables that pull me in their color and that I'm happy to first pick. In this category we find the premium removal spells. These are often going to be the best commons in each color, but we also find value cards, often nice two for ones at uncommon. Then the A rating is given to bomb level cards that heavily pull me in their color, that can dominate a game if they go unanswered. These are often rares or the top tier uncommons. And finally, the S rating is given to ridiculous bombs that I'll go out of my way to include if possible. These are often mythic rares that have an immediate impact when they come into play, and even if the opponent manages to answer them, they will have a lasting impact on the game, and there's very few S tier level cards in each set. So that sums up my rating system. Now every now and then you might hear me say B plus or A minus, just to give a bit more nuance to a card if it's not crystal clear in which category it falls. And also keep in mind that these gradings will fluctuate over time as I get to play the set more, because most of these gradings are based on my experience with Kaladesh and Aether Vault back in the day, but of course Kaladesh Remastered is a brand new experience where both sets are combined and some cards are omitted, which might also affect how the metagame shapes out. Now if you don't have time to watch the entire set review, feel free to skip around, there will be timestamps in the video description so you can jump to a specific color and we'll be going over every color in alphabetical order. Now for all my patrons and Twitch subscribers, I'll also keep an updated spreadsheet with all my card ratings that you can easily reference. So let's get to it! Aetherflux Reservoir, a 4 mana rare artifact saying whenever you cast a spell, you gain 1 life for each spell you've cast this turn and then you can pay 50 life, and then Reservoir deals 50 damage to any target. So Reservoir, not really a limited card, it's definitely a combo payoff or finisher for some constructed decks, and uh, you shouldn't really be looking to include this in limited. So this is one of the rare exceptions that I'm going to give an F, not even a D. I just don't imagine many decks where this is even uh, a consideration, but I'll definitely be brewing some constructed decks around it. Next up we've got Aether Sphere Harvester, a 3 mana a rare vehicle. First time seeing a vehicle here, and there's no shortage of those in Kaladesh. A 3-5 flyer that has a crew cost of 1, so we need to tap 1 power worth of creatures in order to crew with the Aether Sphere Harvester. Now just a quick side note about uh, vehicles in general. You're definitely allowed to tap multiple creatures to crew a vehicle, even if they exceed the crew cost. So if you want to, for some reason, tap three creatures to uh, crew the Harvester, you're totally free to do so, if you would want to. And um, you can also crew a vehicle that's already tapped, that's also totally fine. So just some side notes here when talking about vehicles. And then Harvester is a 3-5, and when it enters the battlefield you get 2 energy, so not only is this our first vehicle, but it's also the first instance of energy. So energy counters are kind of like poison counters, they're handed to a player, and in Kaladesh itself there's no real way for the opponent to interact with your energy counters, so once you get an energy counter, they'll stay with you until you decide to spend them on the various abilities in Kaladesh. And in this case we can pay one energy and then the Harvester gains a lifelink until end of turn. So it makes it very difficult to race. The crew cost is incredibly low, so almost any creature can crew the Harvester. And yeah, 3-5 lifelink is huge, can attack, block, gain life, makes it very difficult to race. So Harvester definitely gets an A rating from me. A very powerful card that goes into any deck, so it's also perfect first pick. 
Next up we've got Aetherworks Marvel, another constructed staple. A 4 mana legendary artifact and mythic saying whenever a permanent you control is put into a graveyard you get one energy and then you can tap the Aetherworks Marvel and pay this is where it gets kind of complicated to count all the energy symbols, six energy, and then you can look at the top six cards of your library and cast a spell from among them without paying its mana cost and put the rest on the bottom in a random order. Definitely a card that's going to see a ton of constructed play, great combo enabler, you can cast an Ulamog off of it and get the cast trigger exiling two permanents, so that's going to be one of the first decks I'll be exploring once uh, Kaladesh releases on Arena. But uh, when it comes to limited, Marvel isn't really the powerhouse that it is in Constructed. Since getting to 6 energy, while you might be able to build a Constructed deck that can easily get to 6 energy, it's a lot more complicated and limited. Uh, now you do get energy when a permanent you control is put into a graveyard, so that can definitely come up. A creature dies, you get a bit of energy. But overall I wouldn't overrate Marvel in limited, just because it's such a powerful card in Constructed. Also, once you sink all that energy into the Marvel, the payoff is going to be a random card in the top six, which may or may not be worth all the investment. So I don't think Marvel is particularly good in limited. I would give it a D. Maybe there's a deck with a lot of expensive cards where this could be okay, and you've got a ton of energy production. But uh, I wouldn't be uh, baited by the Marvel. Definitely not one of the better limited cards. So I'll give it a D. And for Constructed, a brief side note here, if you play a second Aetherworks Marvel because it is legendary, one of them will end up in the graveyard and you get two energy because the Marvels see the other Marvel go to the graveyard. So just a side note for Constructed. Next up we have Animation Module, one mana rare artifact. Whenever one or more plus one plus one counters are put on a permanent you control, you may pay one mana and if you do, you make a 1-1 one, one colorless servo artifact creature token. So there is a pretty big plus one plus one counter theme in Kaladesh, as we'll see with the Fabricate mechanic, which allows you to either make 1-1 one, one servo tokens or put plus one plus one counters on your creature. So of course those creatures will combine quite nicely with Animation Module. And then you can pay three mana and tap Animation Module and choose a counter on target permanent or player and give that permanent or player another counter of that kind. So the counter that uh, references a player, of course, is going to be an energy counter, so you can increase your energy, but you can also choose a plus one plus one counter on a creature that's already in play, which not only will give you an extra plus one counter, but will also allow you to pay the one mana to make a servo token. So as soon as you get one energy, or as soon as you get one plus one counter on a creature, animation module can kind of take over the game by itself, and you don't need much more help. So module is an amazing card. Uh, does require a little bit of setup to get it going, but it's not too difficult to get a few creatures with plus one counters in your deck. So module, I think I'm even willing to give an A, just because of how quickly it can get out of hand and take over the late game. And for one mana it's very cheap, so it's also a quick way to get an artifact in play. And as we'll see, there's also a lot of cards that just care about having a certain number of artifacts in play, making module even more valuable. Then we have a Ballista Charger, a 5 mana vehicle, that's a 6-6, six, six, and the crew cost is 3, so we need to tap a total of 3 or more power to crew the Ballista Charger. So you can tap a 1-powered creature and a 2-powered creature, you can tap a 3-powered creature, you can tap a 4-powered creature, all those will be sufficient to crew the Charger. And then we get a 6-6, six, six, and when a Charger attacks it deals 1 damage to any target. So. Charger, definitely one of the more expensive vehicles to both play and crew, but it does definitely do a lot of damage as a 6-6 six, six that can ping any targets, so it's quite powerful. Um, just need to make sure that you have enough creatures to crew it, so in a deck with only vehicles and removal spells it's not going to be very good, but in a creature deck it's going to do quite a bit of work. So I think this falls somewhere in the C plus, B minus category. Uh, it's definitely a playable vehicle, not the best vehicle I've ever seen, but uh, definitely a card that's going to make your deck more often than not, as long as you've got a high creature count. So I think I like a C plus on Ballista Charger. Then we've got a Barricade Breaker, 7 mana for a 7-5 uncommon artifact creature Juggernaut with Improvise. Improvise another mechanic in Kaladesh that allows you to pay for some cards by tapping artifacts. So if you have, let's say, two random artifacts, they could be creatures, they could be non-creatures, you can tap those to contribute towards paying for the Barricade Breaker. 
and then Breaker attacks each combat if able. So it's a 7-5, which is quite large. You could potentially get it in play on, let's say, turn 4, turn 5, if you've got a dedicated artifact deck with plenty of cheap artifacts. There's quite a few cards that even make artifact tokens, which make it easy to enable your improvised cards. So the Breaker does hit pretty hard, but it does have the downside of having to attack each combat if able. So it's not always your preferred mode if you need to sit back and play defense. So Breaker's a playable card. Uh, it's of course going to be better in more aggressive decks, decks with maybe removal spells or combat tricks to make sure the opponent can't easily trade for your barricade breaker. But yeah, if it goes unanswered, it can quickly end the game. So I think I like somewhere between a C and a C plus for barricade breaker. It's a playable card, but it's pretty context dependent of how good it's going to be. So I'll go with a C for barricade breaker. Then we've got Bastion Mastodon, a 5 mana, 4 5 artifact creature elephant. And for a white mana, the Mastodon gains a vigilance until end of turn. This is going to be a cycle of creatures that are artifacts that have a colored activated ability. And these creatures are sometimes playable even if you don't have the colored mana required to use the ability. But for the most part, they're just going to be filler cards that aren't super exciting, but uh, usually playable if you just need some filler. And it's no different here. Uh, Mastodon 5 mana 4 5. It's an artifact creature, so can maybe help you with a couple artifact synergies. But it's also an artifact, so there are some cards that can specifically destroy artifacts, like we had in uh, Theros with uh, enchantments. So it's a bit the same here, where the expensive artifacts kind of need to pull their weight, because otherwise they might be answered by a cheap common removal spell. So the Mastodon. I don't think is one of the more exciting artifact cards in Kaladesh. It is playable if you just need a filler card. This lands somewhere between a D and a C, so definitely not one of the better creatures. But if you're in white, then a 4-5 Vigilance can definitely do some work. So I would say a D outside of a white deck, maybe a C in a white deck. Then we've got a Beaumont Bazaar Barge, a 4 mana 5-5 five five vehicle. And when the barge enters the battlefield, you get to draw a card. So you get immediate value, and then the crew cost is 3 to have a 5-5. Five five. Yeah, the ba Bazaar Barge is great. Getting to draw a card right away always feels great. And then a 5-5, five five, even if the crew cost is r relatively high at 3, still does quite a bit of damage. So I like a B for the Beaumont Bazaar Barge. It's only fitting. Then we've got Beaumont Courier, another staple from uh, Kaladesh here, a 1 mana 1-1 one, one artifact creature construct with haste, and when the courier attacks, you exile the top card of your library face down, so it kinda hides a few packages for you, and then for a red mana, you discard your hand and sacrifice Bowman Courier, and put all cards exiled with the courier into their owner's hands. So the courier is gonna be great for constructed as well, but it was also quite good in limited, just as a 1-1 one, one that can usually get in one or two attacks before the opponent prevent, pre presents a blocker. So let's say you manage to get two attacks in with your courier, you've got two cards exiled face down, then at some point you empty your hand, you attack with the courier one last time, it exiles a third card, and then you can sacrifice it before damage, essentially drawing three cards, and in the meantime you had a 1-1 one, one artifact in play to maybe enable improvise, when uh, you sacrifice a Beaumont Courier, it can also enable some other synergies like Revolt. So the Courier does quite a few things for being a 1-1 and uh, should not be underestimated. So I think I like an A rating for Beaumont Courier, which might seem high, but I think the card's quite good and uh, ticks a lot of different boxes. And uh, yeah, it can just provide a ton of card advantage if used right. But of course you do need a red mana to activate it, so... Don't go picking it outside of a red deck. Then Chief of the Foundry, a 3 mana, 2-3 uncommon artifact creature construct, giving other artifact creatures you control plus one plus one. And this is an artifact set, so there's no shortage of artifact creatures. There's some servo tokens, so there are artifact tokens as well. So Chief of the Foundry, pretty strong card, great with vehicles as well, which will also get the plus one plus one bonus. So I like uh, B for Chief of the Foundry, pretty good early pick as well, just because it's colorless and goes into any deck. Cogworkers Puzzle Knots. The Puzzle Knots are also a cycle of cards in Kaladesh. They're artifacts with a colored activated ability to sacrifice them. 
And in this case, we've got a white one, Cogworkers Puzzle Knot. When it enters the battlefield, creates a 1 1 colorless servo artifact creature token. So not only do you get a Puzzle Knot as an artifact, but you also get an artifact creature token. So that counts towards uh, improvise twice, essentially, since you've got two artifacts to potentially tap. And the Puzzle Knots are also great at enabling Revolt, which we'll probably get to a bit later. And Revolt is a mechanic that cares about permanence leaving the battlefield. So by sacrificing your Puzzle Knots, you can enable Revolt for your Revolt synergies. And for one and a white, we can sacrifice a Puzzle Knot to make another 1-1 one, one colorless servo artifact creature token. So you can potentially get two tokens out of the deal. And yeah, enable a lot of small synergies. So the Puzzle Knot is not a powerful card by itself but it is definitely a card that can enable a lot of various synergies between Improvise, Revolt, just making some artifact creature tokens, which can be useful with, uh, let's say, the previous card we've seen that pumps artifact creatures. So the Puzzle Knot, again, not a powerful card by itself necessarily, but a great enabler for a lot of synergies. So I like C+, for the Puzzle Knot. It's a very good role player in a lot of white decks. And you could even play it in a deck that doesn't have the white mana to sacrifice it if you just care about Improvise and having those two early artifacts in play. Next up we have Consulate Skygate, a 2 mana 04 artifact creature wall with Defender and Reach. So just a purely defensive card, it's not going to help you crew vehicles, which is a pretty big downside, but it does potentially help you with Improvise. So Skygate, not an exceptionally uh, powerful card, and usually doesn't make the deck. Sometimes you can board it in if the opponent has a lot of flyers, if you're playing best of three, but I would not recommend uh, main decking it very often, so this is a D. And then we have Consulate Turret, a three-man artifact that can tap to give you one energy, and then you can tap it, pay three energy, and then it deals two damage to target player or planeswalker. So it doesn't deal damage to creatures. So Consulate Turret, from what I remember playing it uh, back in the day, wasn't a card that make, made your deck very often. It might seem nice to have a way to produce energy, but only making one energy doesn't really do all that much. Most cards need quite a bit of energy to really be worth it. So even making one energy per turn isn't really worth the investment of three mana. And then only being able to deal damage to players and not creatures makes this pretty weak. So Consulate Turret I think is a D as well, and you're not going to include it very often, unless you've got a super synergistic energy deck. Cultivator's Caravan, a 3 mana rare vehicle that taps to add 1 mana of any color, so even if you don't crew the vehicle, it acts as a mana rock, so it can fix your mana and ramp, and then a crew cost is 3, but it turns into a 5-5, five five, so it deals quite a bit of damage, even if the crew cost is relatively high but the fact that it has the utility to tap for mana makes this quite useful. So yeah, Caravan is definitely a powerful card. Um, I think I'm giving this somewhere like a B plus, A minus. It is a powerful card, but uh, definitely not the best vehicle out there. That title probably goes to a card that uh, is banned, or at least they didn't include in uh, Kaladesh Remastered, so we won't be seeing that one. But uh, Caravan, definitely a solid card, even saw some constructed play. Then we've got Daredevil Dragster, a 3-mana uncommon vehicle. Crew cost is 2, and it's a 4-4, four, four, so this one's a little bit easier to crew than some of the previous vehicles we've seen. And at the end of combat, if the Dragster attacked or blocked, put a Velocity Counter on it, and then if, if it has 2 or more Velocity Counters on it, we have to sacrifice it, but you get to draw 2 cards. So, Dragster is another interesting vehicle. The fact that the crew cost is only 2, makes it pretty easy to crew, both on offense and defense, since of course you can also crew vehicles on defense to block with them. And uh, yeah, it comes down early, so if you go 2-drop, Dragster on 3, then on turn 4 you can start attacking, or potentially already block on turn 3 if uh, you crew defensively. And then getting 2 cards out of the deal means that uh, it can provide a nice bit of card advantage as well. So Dragster is definitely a solid card, happy to give this a B. Then we've got a decoction module. The modules are also a cycle, so if you get all the different modules in play, you can get some crazy synergies going. So this is an uncommon at 2 mana, and whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, you get 1 energy. And then for 4 mana, we can tap decoction module and return target creature you control to its owner's hand. 
Now, this might seem like a bit of a weird effect. So first off, what the Coction module does is it can potentially save a creature from removal or from maybe an enchantment that has your creature trapped. So a module can save those. It's also a way to re-enable energy. Since, of course, when a creature enters, it makes one energy. So in the late game, you can just start picking up your random creatures to re-enter the battlefield and make more energy. But it also has great synergy with the cycle of creatures that we'll see in just a second. And that's the thriving cycle of uh, creatures that generate energy when they enter the battlefield. So it also synergizes very well with those, since you get the additional energy from the creature entering the battlefield, as well as the creature itself making energy. So the Coction Module is definitely a synergy card, but it is a card that can do a lot of work in the late game if you've got all the spare mana to pick up creatures, replay them, make more energy, and then with all that energy you can spend it on your various energy payoffs. And uh, yeah, there's definitely a lot of neat things you can do with the Coction Module, but it is a bit of a slow card that requires a bit of setup. So it's not going to be great in just any deck, but uh, can definitely do a lot of work in the late game, as I've said. So the Coction module, I'll probably give a C plus. That's probably around where you want to take this. But uh, yeah, it's definitely a card that can potentially set up for some crazy synergies. Then we've got Demolition Stomper, a six mana uncommon vehicle. And uh, the crew cost is quite prohibitive at five. So we need a total of five or more power to crew the Demolition Stomper. And then it's a 10, seven that cannot be blocked by creatures with power two or less. Yeah, not being able to be blocked by smaller creatures. There's also some small Death Touch creatures in the set, which the Demolition Stomper can get past. That is definitely a relevant line of text. But Crew 5, that's kind of the main uh, thing that's keeping the Stomper from being a great card, because uh, it's not that easy to always get 5 power in play to Crew the Demolition Stomper. But uh, that being said, it is potentially a playable card. Uh, some decks might have a lot of high-powered creatures with low toughness that maybe get one or two attacks in early on, but then can't really keep attacking, and those make for perfect creatures to crew these large vehicles like Demolition Stomper. And it's definitely a card I've put in my deck before, but uh, yeah, it's uh, definitely a card with a few drawbacks. So I think I like C for Demolition Stomper. Next up we have Dukara, Peafowl. Another one of those creatures with a colored activated ability. This one's a 4 mana, 2 4 artifact creature bird, and for a blue mana, it gains flying until end of turn. I've got good memories of the P Fowl, just a solid creature to play early, can block, play defense. There's a lot of random 3 powered creatures in the set, so having a 2 4 lines up quite well. And then in the late game, if there's a board stall, you can start activating the ability to fly over and deal some damage. So Peafowl is definitely one of the better of uh, the cycle of these artifact creatures. So I think I'm even willing to give this a C plus in a blue deck. And then outside of a blue deck, it's probably more like a D or a C, but uh, definitely a playable card. Then we have a Dynavolt Tower, a three mana artifact at rare saying whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you get two energy and then you can tap the tower and pay a total of five energy to deal three damage to any target. Now this was also a centerpiece of some controlling decks back in standard. Uh, for limited casting instants and sorceries, it's not always that easy to have a lot of them. Uh, it's not like there's a multitude of opts uh, to really go with the Dynavolt Tower, for instance, since this is an artifact set, so there's not really that much of a focus on instants and sorceries. So could be a nice build around for Constructed. In Limited, it's a lot more difficult to make this work, so I wouldn't overestimate this card. Of course, you can also potentially have other cards that generate energy uh, to let you activate Dynavolt Tower, but 5 energy is a pretty big investment for 3 damage, even if it can potentially take out one or two creatures using that ability. So I'll land on a C plus for Dynavolt Tower, but could be a fun build around. Then we have Eager Construct, 2 mana 2-2 two, two, Artifact Creature Construct. When it enters the battlefield, each player may scry 1. So it's not an amazing card. If you just need a filler 2-drop, this will do. It can potentially help with improvised synergies. So it does have that going for it. So yeah, Eager Construct, probably just to see. Nothing special, but sometimes you'll play it if you need some filler 2-drops. And gets better with improvise. Then we have Electrostatic Pummeler, a 3 mana, 1-1 one, one artifact creature construct at rare. And when a Pummeler enters the battlefield, you get 3 energy. 
and you can pay 3 energy to give the pummeler plus x plus x until end of turn where x is its power. So this is also a very fun build around for constructed. If you can generate a ton of energy and play some pump spells on a pummeler before using the ability, it can potentially one hit KO the opponent with a lot of damage to spare. Uh, for limited, not a great card, but uh, if you've got some pump spells in green or red, and you've got other energy cards, this could be okay as a way to potentially threaten lethal, and then you can always decide to use your energy on other energy payoffs. But again, I wouldn't rate the pummeler too highly because of its constructed applications, so this is probably a C, C plus for pummeler, nothing special, but definitely a fun card. Then we have Fabrication Module, another one of those modules. So this is a 3 mana uncommon artifact saying whenever you get one or more energy, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control, and for 4 mana you can tap it to get one energy. So this card is also great, since it also kind of functions by itself without needing any other help, since in the late game you just pay for mana, get an energy, and put a counter somewhere, which, you know, is a nice ability to have if the game stalls out. There's plenty of other energy producing cards in the set, I've uh, mentioned the thriving cycle of creatures, those make energy, so those all work very well with Fabrication Module, and will quickly add up to a lot of plus one plus one counters. So Fabrication Module I think I take a little bit higher than the previous module we've seen. Uh, the previous one I believe I gave like a C+, this is probably closer to a B, and of course if you can get both in play at the same time they also synergize very well with each other, so be on the lookout to get both in play if possible. Filigree Familiar, 3 mana, 2 2 uncommon artifact creature fox, and when it enters the battlefield you gain 2 life, and when a familiar dies you get to draw a card. So just a nice little value creature, and kind of goes into pretty much any deck. Uh, it's also an artifact for potential artifact synergies. So yeah, Familiar is a fine card. Um, this is at the very least a C+, just a good value card, and uh, you're never unhappy to include this in your decks. So also makes for a pretty good early pick, since it's so flexible. Then we have Fireforger's Puzzle Knot, a 2 mana artifact that when it enters a battlefield deals 1 damage to any target, and for 2 in a red we can sacrifice the Puzzle Knot to deal 1 more damage to any target. So this is not one of the better Puzzle Knots, unless the opponent happens to have a lot of 1 toughness creatures, but it is still a way to again enable your improvised synergies, and for 2 in a red it can also enable Revolt, although it's a bit of on, the, on the expensive side for 2 in a red, since often you want to be able to enable Revolt and then still have a lot of mana to play your Revolt cards afterwards. Yeah, the Puzzle Knot's probably closer to a D than a C. Um, I don't have very fond memories of the red Puzzle Knot as opposed to some of the other ones, so I'll give uh, Fireforgers a D, but some decks might want it. And of course, feel free to sideboard this in if the opponent has a lot of 1 toughness creatures. Foundry Inspector, 3 mana, 3-2, three, uncommon artifact creature construct, saying artifact spells you cast cost 1 generic mana less to cast. So Foundry Inspector goes nicely into any artifact heavy decks, of course also discounts vehicles. There's a lot to like about Foundry Inspector, especially powerful in improvise heavy decks that want to play a ton of artifacts and quickly get on the board. So yeah, I like a B for Foundry Inspector, just a solid card, and 3 power is also perfect for crewing a lot of different vehicles, since you don't often want to attack with the Inspector itself. Then we have Heart of Kiran, 2 mana mythic rare legendary artifact vehicle. It's a 4-4 with flying and vigilance, and crew cost is 3. And uh, this isn't very relevant for limited, but for constructed it can definitely come up. You may remove a loyalty counter from a planeswalker you control rather than pay the Heart of Kiran's crew cost. So in a planeswalker heavy deck you can definitely make good use of Heart of Kiran. For limited this is just 2 mana 4-4 four, four, that has a crew cost of 3. So not the easiest to crew at 3, but definitely not impossible. And then 4-4 Flying Vigilance means you can potentially attack with it and also crew it to uh, be able to block with it on defense. So Heart of Kirin definitely hits very hard and uh, can get it in play early so it can potentially contribute towards improvised synergies. So yeah, I like an A for Heart of Kirin, just a good early pick, goes into pretty much any deck. 
Then we have Hope of Girapur, 1 mana, 1-1 one, one legendary artifact creature Thopter with flying, and you can sacrifice Hope of Girapur, and until your next turn, target player who was dealt combat damage by Hope of Girapur cannot cast non-creature spells. So Hope of Girapur, just a cheap artifact to get in play to help you with Improvise, so the Improvise decks are gonna like it, and then a 1-1 one, one flyer can chip in for a little bit of damage, and then the ability to sacrifice it is not going to come up a whole lot, but maybe if you have lethal on the board, you can ensure that the opponent can't come back by playing a bunch of removal spells, for instance. Uh, don't look too much at the ability to sacrifice Hope of Girapur, mostly look at it as a cheap way to get an artifact in play and potentially enable Improvise. So it's not an especially powerful card um, for that purpose, but it's still a fine role player in some uh, synergistic decks. So I like uh, C plus for Hope of Girapur. Nothing exciting, but definitely playable. Then we have Implement of Examination, three mana artifact. And for one blue mana, you can sacrifice Implement of Examination to draw a card. And when the Implement is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you also get to draw a card. So when you play this for three mana, it does nothing. But then you pay one blue mana and all of a sudden you get to draw two cards essentially. So it's a little bit expensive to pay the three up front. You would much rather have a cheaper mana cost and then a more expensive activated ability to potentially help you with improvise. So uh, doesn't have that going for it, but this is definitely a playable card. Uh, plus there's some other ways to potentially sacrifice artifacts to uh, still get the card out of the implement if needed. So you don't lose out on too much value. Uh, but that being said, I wouldn't rate this card too highly. It's still pretty slow to get two cards out of it. So I would give Implement of Examination a C. Implement of Malice, two mana artifact. And for one black mana, you can sacrifice it to make target player discard a card. And when the Implement is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you get to draw a card as well. So this one's much cheaper to get in play makes the opponent discard a card and you get to draw a card for a total of three mana, so it's not a very big investment. So this one I like a lot more because it's cheaper to get in play, so it's much more useful at enabling your uh, improvised cards. Now both implements here that we've seen are very good at enabling revolt, so they only cost one mana to sacrifice and potentially help you enable revolt by having a permanent leave the battlefield. So that's what they're mostly used for but uh, Implement of Malice a lot better with Improvise as well, and just uh, kind of cheaper to make use of. So I like a C plus for Implement of Malice. Definitely a fine role player. Inventor's Goggles, one mana for an artifact equipment, giving the equipped creature plus one plus two, and when an artificer enters a battlefield under your control, you can attach the goggles to it for free, otherwise the equip cost is two. So Goggles, Definitely remember this being pretty solid in a lot of more aggressive red decks or blue red decks or to be honest almost every color has a lot of artificers so in those decks goggles can do a lot of work as just a cheap artifact to get in play to first enable improvise and then later it just makes it so your smaller creatures have a better time attacking so goggles definitely a fine card um, but not every deck is going to want it if it doesn't have very many artificers because the equip cost of two is pretty pricey if you have to use it over and over again. But it is also nice that you can potentially attack with your Artificer and then play an Artificer second main phase and then move the goggles for free. So that sequencing works out quite nicely. So yeah, somewhere between a C and a C plus for the goggles. Not sure yet where this one lands. Depends how many Artificers they ended up including in Kaladesh Remastered. Then we have Iron Thread Crusher, 4 mana, 6-6 six, six vehicle at common, and the crew cost is 3. So this was, I think, an Aether Revolt. Um, pretty solid role player. So this is a great way to kind of uh, crew with your utility creatures, and then this ends up trading off for usually two opposing creatures, or maybe a removal spell. So yeah, Crusher's fine. Probably a C for Iron Thread Crusher. Fine, common. Then we have Key to the City, 2 mana rare artifact, and we can tap it and discard a card, and then up to one target creature cannot be blocked this turn, and when a key becomes untapped you can pay 2 mana and if you do draw a card. So kind of a slow way to loot away cards and uh, 
get in some sneaky damage. But uh, yeah, it does have some cool uh, synergies in the set as well. Of course, being a cheap artifact, also useful for improvise and uh, gives you a way to loot away cards in late game, even if you're not necessarily getting in a ton of evasive damage. So key to the city, fine card, um, probably between a C plus and a B. Uh, I'll start out with a more conservative C plus. It is still quite pricey to pay two mana each turn, so only really in the late game will you be able to use this, but it can be a great way to break a board stall. Then we have a Life Crafter's Best Cherry, a three mana artifact that rare, saying at the beginning of your upkeep, scry one, and whenever you cast a creature spell, you can pay one green mana, and if you do draw a card, so of course you're not going to want this outside of a green deck, but in a green deck this is great. Provides a ton of card selection with a scry and a ton of card advantage with the ability. Also saw a ton of constructed play. So yeah, this card's great in a green deck, easily in A. Then we have a Merchant's a Dock Hand. One mana for a 1-2 artifact creature construct at rare. And then for 4 mana we can tap it and tap X untapped artifacts we control. So this definitely wants to go in the artifact heavy improvised type decks. And then we can look at the top X cards of our library, put one of them into our hand and the rest on the bottom. So this does provide card advantage. And the more artifacts we tap, the more card selection we get with that card advantage as well. Being a 1 mana 1-2, one, just a quick way to get an artifact in play, enable improvise and enable other cards that care about having artifacts in play. So just these 1 and 2 mana artifacts are a lot better than they may seem at first glance. So I like Dockhand quite a bit, I'm willing to give this a B. Metallic Mimic, 2 mana 2-1 two, artifact creature shapeshifter at rare. When it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. And then the Mimic is also the chosen creature type in addition to its other types. And each other creature you control of the chosen type enters the battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on it. So a great card for any tribal decks in Constructed. In Limited, this uh, will definitely vary based on the deck composition. But at the very least, it's a 2-mana two 2-1 two artifact creature. And will at the very least provide uh, one counter, assuming you can name a creature that's in your deck. Uh, and preferably in your hand. But uh, yeah, let's say you name Artificer and you've got a very synergistic Artificer deck. This can definitely get out of hand. So yeah, I like a B for Metallic Mimic. Solid card and potentially also works with a couple of those plus one plus one counter synergies that we saw earlier. And then Metalwork Colossus, 11 mana, 10 10 artifact creature construct at rare. And it costs X less to cast, where X is the total converted mana cost of non-creature artifacts you control. So uh, vehicles count as long as they're not crewed, I believe. Uh, you can sacrifice two artifacts to return the Colossus from your graveyard to your hand. So this is a card that did see quite a bit of constructed play as well. Uh, for limited, it's still quite powerful. Uh, so this wants to go with all those puzzle knots we've seen earlier that can make the Colossus cheaper and also provide a lot of random artifacts for you to sacrifice to get the Colossus back from the graveyard. And definitely a bit of a build around card, doesn't go into any deck, but uh, usually you should be able to uh, make good use out of this. So I think I like B for Metal War Colossus. Definitely a, a nice, fun build around. Yeah, in Constructed you can often cast it for very little. Then we have a mobile garrison, 3 mana for a 3-4 vehicle at common. And when the garrison attacks, untap another target artifact or creature you control. And yeah, for only a crew cost of 2, it's definitely one of the easier uh, vehicles to crew. So it's both relatively cheap to play, relatively cheap to crew. It's not the biggest vehicle out there, but uh, getting to untap an artifact or creature can also be useful sometimes. So yeah, I like C plus for Mobile Garrison, just a fine role player, and uh, will definitely make most of your aggressive creature decks. Then we have Narnum Cobra, another one of those creatures with a colored activated ability. So a two mana, two one artifact creature snake, and for a green mana, it gains death touch until end of turn. So yeah, this uh, is just another cre cheap artifact creature to get in play, enable improvise, and then in a late game, it can still potentially trade off for one of the opponent's larger vehicles. Just a fine role player. I like C for Narnum Cobra, and potentially even C plus in uh, some more dedicated artifact synergy decks. Then we have Ornithopter, zero mana for an O2 
artifact creature Thopter with flying. So this is a cheap way to enable improvise, but that's kind of where this ends. And not having any power means it can't crew any vehicles, which is a pretty big downside. So outside the hyper synergistic improvised decks that want to play a bunch of stuff for free, this is not going to do a whole lot for you. So I think I'm giving this a D. But I do recall seeing this in play in Limited before, and it wasn't always embarrassing. Then we have Oval Chase Dragster, 4 mana for a 6-1 artifact vehicle at Uncommon. Crew cost is only 1, and it has both Trample and Haste. So this is a type of vehicle that you can play, and then crew right away for just 1 power total. And uh, yeah, then it gets in for 6. So you do kind of have to wait for the board to line up properly. You want the opponent to uh, essentially not have any creatures back to block. And then you can sneak this in and get a nice hit in for 6. And then you kind of force the opponent to stay back on defense to try and block the dragster. And the fact that it is a trample means that even on the second attack, uh, the opponent's likely still taking a bit of damage. It does require the right timing to really perform. If the opponent always has a random token back, it's not going to feel great. But there are some cards in the set, as we'll see later, that also synergize with vehicles, maybe giving them flying or other additional abilities. So those will also make the dragster a lot better. But uh, yeah, in an aggressive deck, if you can get a hidden for six without having a trade, then uh, it's going to be great for you. But that situation might not always line up. So overall, I'll give dragster a C plus, but it definitely has more upside than that if it lines up properly. Pacification Array, 1 mana artifact at Uncommon. And for 2 mana we can tap it to tap target artifact or creature. And uh, being a 1 mana artifact, again, I want to stress is very important for various improvised synergies. So that's also a big deal. And yeah, this is just a repeatable removal spell. You can potentially tap a creature end of turn and then untap and tap another creature down. So you can get a good attack in. Just kind of a nightmare to face down. Now, there are definitely more answers to artifacts in this set than there might be in a different set, and people will often main deck answers to artifacts, so it's not necessarily going to stick around forever, but it is kind of a must-answer artifact for just one mana. So I think I'm giving Pacification Array an A, just because it's so cheap and powerful, and also a must-answer. Then we have Penharmonicon, 4 mana artifact and rare, saying if an artifact or creature entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. So there's no shortage of artifacts and creatures with ETB effects. We've seen, let's say, the Puzzle Knot cycle. Those are artifacts with ETB effects, and we'll see later. There's an entire cycle of creatures that generate energy when they enter the battlefield, so those will also get better with Penharmonicon. So it's definitely a synergy card, not every deck is going to want this, but in the right deck, Panharmonicon can do a lot of work. So I like a B, maybe B plus for Panharmonicon. Um, definitely a bit of a build around, but in the right deck, it can provide a ton of value. And of course, a great card for Constructed as well. Paradox Engine, 5 mana, Mythic Rare, Legendary Artifact, saying whenever you cast a spell, untap all non-land permanents you control. For limited... I don't think it's very good, just because the effect is kind of marginal. Um, giving your things pseudo-vigilance is not really what we're all about. But uh, for Constructed, this is a great combo enabler, especially with various artifacts that generate mana. You can potentially go off with this and uh, some random artifacts that generate mana, and then maybe Mystic Forge to provide card advantage, let you play stuff over the top. And then Mystic Forge can also get rid of lands on the top of your deck. And then maybe you can use your uh, Ether Flux Reservoir as your win condition. So definitely going to build that deck and construct it for limited. I think this is probably either a D or an F. I don't see many decks where I would want this. But uh, definitely has a lot of combo potential. Peace Walker Colossus, 3 mana, a rare artifact vehicle. And it's a 6-6, six, six, but the crew cost is 4. 4 definitely pretty high. And for 1 and a white, another target vehicle you control becomes an artifact creature until end of turn. So what that means is that you don't have to crew the vehicle, and you can just turn it into a creature for 1 and a white, which is pretty nice. It does say another target vehicle, so it can't crew itself for 1 and a white. 
but it's very good at crewing author vehicles. Um, now, of course, the problem is if you have a deck with only vehicles and not enough creatures, and you don't draw your Peacewalker Colossus, it's going to be a little awkward. So you still can't really take the risk of playing too many vehicles without creatures, even if you have a Colossus in the deck. So, yeah, Peacewalker Colossus, fine card, but I wouldn't overrate it necessarily, since there's not going to be that many decks with only vehicles in them. But, uh, yeah, I like B for Peacewalker Colossus. Then we have Pendulum of Patterns, 2 mana artifact at common. When it enters the battlefield you gain 3 life, and for 5 mana we can tap and sacrifice it to draw a card. Pretty expensive to sacrifice, it is cheap to get in play for Improvise. That being said, I'm not very interested in this card, I don't remember casting it very often. So yeah, I'll give this a D. Planar Bridge, 6 mana, legendary artifact at Mythic, and for 8 mana we can tap it and search our library for a permanent card and put it on the battlefield. Yeah, this is incredibly expensive, 6 mana to play, 8 mana to activate, so it's 40 mana before it does anything. Uh, of course it will take over the game once you get to activate it turn after turn, but it's just prohibitively expensive, so this is a D. Prakata Pillar Bug, 3 mana, 2, 3, artifact, creature, insect, and for a single black mana it gains a lifelink until end of turn. So a solid little creature. Uh, 2 power, not the best in terms of crewing vehicles, you would much prefer a 3 powered creature for uh, crewing vehicles, but it is nice in uh, racing situations being able to give it lifelink for a black mana. So yeah, Pillar Bug, just a playable card, I'll give this a C. And then Prophetic Prism, definitely have fond memories of uh, Prophetic Prism, 2 mana artifact, when it enters the battlefield you get to draw a card, and it also fixes our mana, since for 1 mana we can tap it and add one mana of any color to our mana pool. So in some of those artifact-heavy decks that might want to splash various activated abilities for the Puzzle Knots, for instance, the uh, Prism is perfect. And uh, of course being an artifact has plenty of upside as well in this set. So I like C plus for Prism, it's a card you're sometimes going to take quite highly just because of the mana fixing potential. And then Renegade map is very similar, one mana artifact that enters the battlefield tapped and you can sacrifice it and search your library for a basic land card and put it into your hand. So this is both a cheap artifact to enable Improvise, but it's also a very nice way to enable Revolt. Uh, we still haven't seen any Revolt cards, but again if a permanent leaves the battlefield that can potentially enable some cool Revolt synergies and Renegade map is a very low investment at one mana and can then be sacrificed to enable Revolt. So Renegade map, I'm willing to give C+, maybe even B-, minus. definitely a, a solid role player, both at fixing your mana and enabling Revolt and Improvise. A Reservoir Walker, 5 mana, 3-3, three, three, Artifact Creature Construct, and when it enters the battlefield you gain 3 life and get 3 energy. I don't think this card very often made the final cut, uh, it looks playable on paper, but it just doesn't make the cut very often, since it kind of fits in the same slot as you would typically include your vehicles, and the vehicles are typically just better. So, yeah, Walker, probably just a D. And then we have Scribe Trawler, 3 mana, 3-2 three, artifact creature construct at rare, and when the Trawler or another artifact you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, Return to your hand target artifact card in your graveyard with lesser converted mana cost. So this enabled some crazy combos in Constructed back in the day. Um, but yeah, it's just a, a good value card. 3 mana, 3-2, three, good at crewing vehicles. And then if you've got some puzzle knots that you sacrificed earlier, you can get those back. Works well with your uh, Renegade map. So it's just a solid card all around. I'll go with the B. Then we have Scribe Heap Scrounger, 2 mana, 3, 2 artifact creature construct at rare, cannot block, but still 3 power, so a 2 mana, 3 powered creature, very good at crewing vehicles. And then for 1 and a black, we can exile another creature card from our graveyard and return a Scrounger from our graveyard to the battlefield. So not even our hand, straight to the battlefield, gets in a ton of damage, so you often need to trade for it, and then the opponent just gets it right back. So Scrounger in a deck that can use the activated ability for one and a black is going to be quite strong, maybe even an A. Uh, in a deck that doesn't have the black mana, it's still okay. So definitely a card you could still play outside of a 
a black deck. Self-assembler, 5 mana, 4-4 four, four, artifact creature, assembly worker at common. I believe they've changed the art for this one too. And when self-assembler enters a battlefield, you may search your library for an assembly worker creature card, reveal it and put it into your hand and shuffle your library. There's not that many assembly workers. I think self-assembler, there maybe was one author assembly worker in entire uh, Kaladesh and Aether Revolt. Not sure if that one got included in Kaladesh Remastered. But either way, uh, self-assembler essentially searches up additional copies of itself. And uh, five mana, four, four. You know, not the best rate, but if you end up with two or three of these, it can provide a nice bit of value. But if you can get two, then I'm willing to give this a C. If you get three, it's probably closer to a C+. Plus, but you also kind of reach this number where you end up with too many of them, and then you risk having too many your opening hands, which is not where you want to be. So I think three copies is probably the sweet spot for self-assembler, where you can potentially chain multiple together, but don't risk drawing too many in your opening hand. So yeah, kind of depends how many copies you can pick up. Servo Schematic, 2 mana artifact at uncommon. When it enters a battlefield or is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you get to make a 1-1 colorless servo artifact creature token. So this is very similar to the white puzzle knot, but it has the uh, kind of the, the disadvantage of not being able to sacrifice it yourself, uh, but it doesn't require any mana to make that second token if you do have a sacrifice outlet. And now I don't recall there being too many sacrifice outlets in Kaladesh or in Aether Vault, so it might be rather tricky to get that second token, but it is still two mana to make two artifacts for improvise, which is great. And then if you do have a few ways of sacrificing artifacts, uh, those will synergize very well with the server schematic as well. So I'm probably giving this around the same rating as a white puzzle knot, which I gave a C+. This might be a little bit lower uh, in decks that don't have any sacrifice outlets, and maybe even a little bit better than the white puzzle knot in decks with plenty of sacrifice outlets to uh, get that extra token out of the schematic. Then we have Sky Skiff, 2 mana for a 2-3 vehicle at common with flying, and the crew cost is only 1. Definitely have fond memories of Sky Skiff just being a nice cheap vehicle to play and get in some uh, chip damage as a two powered flyer. So, yeah, Sky Skiff, definitely a solid card and uh, one of the better common vehicles from what I remember. So, C plus for Sky Skiff is probably where I'll end up. And then Sky Sovereign console flagship, five mana mythic rare legendary vehicle. It's a 6 5 flyer and the crew cost is three. So it's not even that prohibitive. And when Sky Sovereign enters a battlefield or attacks, it deals three damage to target creature or planeswalker and opponent controls. So just playing this for five mana, you already get three damage out of it. And then you just need to attack once or twice and the opponent's board will be decimated. So yeah, Sky Sovereign, probably one of the few S ratings I'm gonna give, goes into any deck. So it's a perfect first pick as well. So just make sure you have enough creatures to crew it and this will win the game by itself, essentially. So S for Sky Sovereign. Then we have Universal Solvent, one mana for an artifact that common, and for seven mana it can be tapped and sacrificed to destroy target permanent. So the activated ability here, incredibly expensive. The reason why you would play Solvent is just as a one mana artifact to enable Improvise. So in a deck with plenty of Improvise cards, this could be playable in a deck that doesn't care about improvise at all, this is just never going to make the cut. So I think this is a D, but some very specific decks might want it. Then we have Untethered Express, 4 mana for an uncommon vehicle. And it's a 4-4 Trampler, and the crew cost is only 1. And when the Express attacks, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. So this card's amazing. Crew cost incredibly cheap, can even crew it with a servo token. And... Uh, Attacks as a 5-5 Trampler, just keeps on growing. So I think I'm willing to give this an A. This is definitely one of the best uncommon vehicles out there, if not the best. Weltfast Monitor, 3 mana for a 3-2 Lizard, and for a red mana it gains Menace until end of turn. So a 3 mana for 3 power, perfect for crewing a lot of vehicles. So that's already kind of nice. So even if you don't have red mana to give it Menace, it could be a fine curve filler. 
And then in a red deck, the menace ability is definitely a nice bonus. So I like C plus for Wild Fast Monitor. The three power versus two power definitely makes a big difference in this set. Then we have a Whirler Maker, three mana uncommon artifact. And for four mana, we can tap it to make a 1-1 one, one colorless Thopter artifact creature token with flying. So it's incredibly slow, seven mana to get our first Thopter. But if the board does stall out, it's a great way to end the game. That being said, I don't recall this doing a ton of work back in uh, the original set where it was printed. So I think this is probably a card that looks kind of okay as kind of a control finisher. But uh, in reality, it's often just a little bit too slow and uh, doesn't often make the cut. So I think this is just a C, but could definitely be a nice uh, way to end the game in a very grindy matchup. Then Workshop Assistant, a 3 mana for a 1-2 artifact creature construct that when it dies can return another target artifact card from your graveyard to your hand. Yeah, it's a, it's a little pricey for a 1-2, doesn't really crew all that well and kind of expensive for improvise. So overall, not a huge fan of the Workshop Assistant, even if it can provide a nice bit of value when it dies. Just requires a little bit too much setup, so I'm giving this a D as well. Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot, 2 mana artifact that when it enters the battlefield it gains 3 life and we get 3 energy. And then for 2 and a green we can sacrifice a Puzzle Knot to gain 3 life and get 3 energy once again. So this is going to be one of the best ways to enable Aetherworks Marvel in Constructed. And also has great synergy with Aetherworks Marvel because if you sacrifice it it's a permanent leaving the battlefield. So we get 1 additional energy from the Marvel. And then a life gain is nice to stay alive against aggressive decks. So that's for constructed. For limited, you know, some decks might have a lot of energy synergy, in which case a puzzle knot could be worth it. But uh, if you don't have any energy synergy, then this card's just not playable. I'm giving puzzle knot probably a C, and you'll have to pick it depending on uh, what kind of deck you're drafting. But in an energy heavy deck, it could be okay. First up we have a Johnny Unyielding, 6 mana for a 4 loyalty Planeswalker and has a lot of powerful abilities. Plus 2 says reveal the top 3 cards of your library, put all non-land permanent cards revealed this way into your hand, the rest goes on the bottom. The minus 2 can exile target creature and its controller gains life equal to its power and then the minus 9 ultimate. So you get a plus three times and then you can minus nine. Put five plus one plus one counters on each creature you control and five loyalty counters on each other planeswalker you control. So a lot of fun in a super friends style deck. But uh, for limited, we're mostly going to be using the plus two and minus two a bunch. And yeah, a giant is amazing. Uh, it's a little pricey at six mana, but starts out at four loyalty, can go up to six right away, provide card advantage if the board is stable and uh, hopefully the minus two can kill the opponent's largest creature and then you can keep a Jani alive to provide more card advantage on the following turn. So I like an A for a Jani. Um, of course being both green and white to cast means it doesn't go into every deck but there's quite a bit of mana fixing as we've seen with cards like Renegade Map, Prophetic Prism, so it's definitely possible to splash a Jani in a deck that doesn't otherwise have both colors. Then we have Cloud Blazer, one of my favorites, a 5 mana 2-2 two, two flyer. And when the Cloud Blazer enters the battlefield, we gain 2 life and draw a card, or draw 2 cards rather. So a ton of value here. And we've seen a few ways to potentially combo with a Cloud Blazer, one of the modules that lets us pick up creatures again. There's a few flicker effects, which they may or may not have included in Kaladesh Remastered to potentially flicker the Cloud Blazer and enable it once again. Yeah, just a, an awesome card. A 2-2 flyer can also get in some nice damage, but uh, it's also a splashable card, much like a Jani. And uh, yeah, awesome card overall, so happy to give this one an A. Then we have Contraband Kingpin, 2 mana for a 1-4 Aetherborn Rogue with lifelink. Whenever an artifact enters a battlefield under your control, scry 1. So 1 for lifelink, pretty good blocker and uh, works well with other artifacts. Blue-black, definitely color combination that cares about playing lots of artifacts and uh, 
potentially sacrificing artifacts as well for value. So the kingpin plays quite nicely in that color pair. So overall, probably give kingpin a B, just a fine role player. Not the best at crewing vehicles, so that's probably not where blue-black shines as opposed to some of the other color pairs. Red-white is probably where you want to be for vehicles. We've got Dark Intimations, a 5-mana rare sorcery, saying each opponent sacrifices a creature or planeswalker, discards a card, and then you return a creature or planeswalker from your graveyard to your hand and draw a card. And then when you cast a Bolas planeswalker spell, that's not super relevant for limited, so we'll just skip that part altogether. But yeah, for, constru or for limited 5-mana, to make the opponent sacrifice and discard, and you get to return and draw, so it's definitely a nice, what is it, 4 for 1 potentially. Ton of value to be had from Dark Intimations. And uh, yeah, 3 colors to cast makes it a little bit tricky, but as we've said, there's no shortage of mana fixing with uh, the artifacts, so pretty much any deck can pick up mana fixing if they really want to. So I like uh, B for Dark Intimations, not the easiest card to cast, but if you can cast it, you'll get your value out of it. Then we have a Dipala, Pilot Exemplar, 3 mana for a 3-3 Legendary Dwarf Pilot, saying other dwarves you control get plus one plus one, and red-white is definitely the color pair with a lot of dwarves, both in red and white. And then each vehicle you control gets plus one plus one as long as it's a creature. And whenever Dipala becomes tapped, you may pay X mana, and if you do, reveal the top X cards of your library, and put all dwarves and vehicles from among them into your hands and the rest on the bottom. So Dipala can potentially crew a vehicle, and you don't even need to attack or block with a vehicle, just the fact that you can tap Dipala at a moment's notice just to be able to use the ability to draw cards is definitely a nice one. If the board ever stalls out, you can just keep using the Pala as a card draw engine, and uh, you'll eventually end up with all the vehicles and dwarves that are in your deck in hand. So that's a great way to potentially take over a game. Uh, being a 3-3 for 3 mana is already a good baseline, and then it both pumps dwarves and vehicles, and there shouldn't be any shortage of those in your colors. So yeah, the pal is awesome, happy to give this one an A, but it does require a bit of a build around, so you'll have to pick up those dwarves and vehicles pretty highly. Then we have Dovin, one of our planeswalkers, 4 mana for 3 loyalty, and the plus 1 says until your next turn up to 1 target creature gets minus 3 minus so, and its activated abilities cannot be activated. So do keep in mind this says up to 1 target creature, so this cannot target a vehicle unless the opponent crewed it in your turn for some reason. Um, so that's definitely a big downside that it can shut down vehicles, but it can shrink down an opposing creature to make it more difficult for the opponent to crew a vehicle. Then the minus one says you gain two life and draw a card, so that's kind of the value-oriented mode that you probably want to be activating as much as possible. And then the minus seven says you get an emblem, saying your opponents cannot untap more than two permanents during their untap steps, which is going to be quite annoying. But you're rarely going to get to the minus seven, assuming you want to just use a minus one to draw cards instead. So Dovin's okay, definitely not one of the more powerful planeswalkers ever seen, and I don't think it saw any constructed play at all. So yeah, Dovin's probably just a B, a nice card if you can protect it and get a few activations out of it, but it doesn't do the best job of protecting itself. You can only use a minus one so many times before he dies. So I like a B for Dovin. Then we have Imperial Voyager, three mana for a 2-3 Vidalcan Scout. It has Flying and Trample, and when a Voyager deals combat damage to a player, you get that many energy counters. So, if it just deals 2 damage, you get 2 energy, but there's various pump spells, of course, you could have in green, and maybe some plus 1 counters to put on the Voyager, making it even better. But just by itself, 2-3 Flying Trample that keeps on keeps accumulating energy is awesome, because blue and green are definitely the colors that care about energy the most. They have a ton of those thriving creatures that care about energy. So Voyager is awesome. Um, I might even be giving this one an A, just because of how much of an engine it is, if it can keep accumulating energy. So I'll give Voyager an A. 
Very powerful card. Engineered Mites, 5 mana for a sorcery at uncommon. So this is the Celestia one, and says choose one between target creature gets plus 5 plus 5 and trample until end of turn, or creatures you control get plus 2 plus 2 and vigilance until end of turn. Now the problem here is that it's a sorcery, so you're not going to catch the opponent off guard by giving your creature plus 5 plus 5 and trample, and 5 mana is also pretty expensive, so they kind of want you to be able to go wide, as we'll see in a second with the various fabricate cards, can allow you to make a bunch of servo tokens and kind of go wide that way. So that's what Selesnya is all about. But uh, it's still kind of an awkward finisher that's kind of expensive and maybe not as powerful as you would like it to be. So I'll give Engineered Might a C, uh, definitely one of the weaker multicolor cards in the cycle. Then we have Hazardous Conditions, 4 mana for a sorcery at uncommon in Golgari, saying creatures with no counters on them get minus 2 minus 2 until end of turn. Yeah, this can be a blowout if used properly. Um, might require a bit of setup, you might have to get into combat and deal a bit of damage to the opponent's creatures, but it could potentially be a blowout. It's going to be very good against the deck trying to make a bunch of servo tokens, that's for sure. That being said, it's kind of pricey at 4 mana for a minus 2, minus 2 effect, and uh, it's maybe not always going to be as one-sided as you would like it to be. Golgari, definitely the color combination with a lot of plus one counter synergy. But uh, yeah, I'll give Conditions a C. It's definitely a playable card. Might go up to a C plus in a very synergistic counters deck, but uh, don't overestimate it. Hidden Stockpile, one on a black and one white for an enchantment at Uncommon. And this was one of the premier revolt payoff cards. And uh, Revolt here says, at the beginning of your end step, if a permanent you controlled left the battlefield this turn, create a 1-1 colorless servo artifact creature token. So this specifically mentions your end step, so you can't enable it in the opponent's turn. But uh, for one mana you can also sacrifice a creature to scry one. So what that means is, as soon as you get your first servo token, you can sacrifice it to scry one, and it will enable Revolt by itself essentially, replacing the token with another one. So Stockpile is kind of a finicky card to play with, but the power level is definitely quite high, and it's not too difficult to assemble an army of servo tokens, and then being able to use this Cry 1 repeatedly to eventually find your finishers is quite powerful too. So yeah, Stockpile is an awesome card, definitely giving this at least a B. Then we have Kambal, Console of Allocation, one black and a white for a legendary Human Advisor, and it's a 2-3 saying whenever an opponent casts a non-creature spell that player loses to and you gain 2 life. So Kambal awesome to have against any potential burn decks in Historic maybe, or combo decks that need to cast multiple spells in the same turn. Uh, as far as limited goes it's still pretty good. Uh, the fact that vehicles count as non-creature spells when they're cast means they still cause uh, Kambal to drain for 2. Yeah, I mean, a 3-mana 2-3 three that maybe drains the opponent for 4-6 to six life in a game is still quite powerful. So I like B for Kambal. Maybe not the most synergistic card, but just the power level is quite high by itself. And might see some sideboard play in Historic as well. Then we have a Maverick Thopterist, 5-mana for a 2-2 Human Artificer at Uncommon. And this is one of those improvised payoff cards. So we can tap our artifacts to help pay for the Thopterist. And when a Thopterist enters a battlefield, we get to make two 1-1 one, one colorless Thopter artifact creature tokens with flying. So it both is a payoff for Improvise, but it can also enable future Improvise cards, potentially setting up very explosive turns. So this is kind of the deck where you want to have all those cheap 1-2 and two mana artifacts to let you quickly play your Thopterists and uh, get on the board quickly. So in a dedicated Improvise deck, Thopterist is going to be awesome can potentially even play it on turn 3 if you go turn 1 artifact, turn 2 make 2 tokens. Um, so that's kind of where you want to be with the Thopterist. And uh, yeah, I'll give Thopterist a B, definitely a powerful card in the improvised decks. And next up we have Oath of Ajani, green and a white for a legendary enchantment at rare. Saying when Oath of Ajani enters a battlefield, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each creature you control. And Planeswalker spells you cast cost one less to cast, so that's not super relevant for limited. So two mana enchantment that puts a plus one counter on each creature. Eh, 
not that exciting. Uh, I think we've seen a similar effect not too long ago at sorcery speeds, just in white. So um, there is a bit of a go white theme, as I've mentioned, in Selesnya, being able to make a bunch of servo tokens with Fabricate. So that's where the Oath of Ajani should be at its best. But uh, it's still not that amazing, so I think I'm giving this a C. Next up we have Outlands Boar, 4 mana in Gruul for a 4-4 boar at uncommon, and it cannot be blocked by creatures with power 2 or less. So this can get past all of those annoying servo tokens and uh, potential death touch creatures in black and hits pretty hard. And 4 power also pretty nice at crewing vehicles that might be even larger. So yeah, Outland Boar, solid card, um, but also nothing special. We've seen similar cards before. So I like C plus for Outland Boar. The fact that there are so many large vehicles make these random vanilla 4-4s four and 5-5s five less impressive than they would be otherwise, since each color might have access to a random 6-6 six six that can just block it. Then we have Rashmi, Eternity's Crafter, so it's a 4-mana 2-3 Legendary Elf Druid in the Simic colors, and says whenever you cast your first spell each turn, reveal the top card of your library, and you may cast it without paying its mana cost if it's a spell with lesser converted mana cost. And if you don't cast it, you still get to put it into your hand. No matter what, if you cast your first spell each turn, you get to draw a card essentially. So that's a lot of value from Rashmi. It is a 4 mana 2-3, which isn't all that big, so it could potentially be answered by some cheaper removal spells. But uh, yeah, if you can untap with Rashmi once or twice, you should be able to take over the game. So I like an A for Rashmi, definitely a fun card to pick up and build around. Then we have a Renegade Rallier, another Revolt card, 3 mana 3-2 three in Selesnya, and when a Rallier enters a battlefield, if a permanent you controlled left the battlefield this turn, return target permanent card with converted mana cost 2 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. So this is perfect with that Renegade map we were talking about earlier, very good with the Puzzle Knots as well. Uh, so it does require a bit of setup, but usually nice 2 for 1, so I like B for Renegade Rallier. Then we have Renegade Wheelsmith, 3 mana for a 3-2 three, three Dwarf Pilot, so once again perfect for crewing all those crew 3 vehicles. And when the Wheelsmith becomes tapped, target creature cannot block this turn, so you can crew a vehicle which will automatically tap the Wheelsmith, and then the ability will trigger and that can take out an opposing blocker. So perfect for the red-white vehicles deck. And yeah, can definitely make it very difficult for the opponent to block, so they'll have to take out a wheelsmith to have a chance. So I like a B for the wheelsmith. Very powerful card for the vehicle decks. Restoration Gearsmith, 4 mana for a 3-3 Human Artificer at Uncommon in Orzhov. And when the Gearsmith enters the battlefield, return target artifact or creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So it can be any artifact or creature, doesn't matter how big. And uh, yeah, 3-3 three, three for 4, so just a nice 2 for 1 once again. All these multicolor cards are awesome, and the Gearsmith is no exception. So I like a B for the Gearsmith as well. Then a Rogue Refiner, 3 mana for a 3-2 Human Rogue at Uncommon. When it enters a battlefield, draw a card and you get two energy. Had to be banned in standard, if I remember correctly, because it was too good. And yeah, this card's awesome. Uh, just provides value immediately when it enters a battlefield. Makes some energy, so perfect for the blue-green energy decks. And three power also crews vehicles. So Rogue Refiner, probably the high end of these multicolor cards. Uh, might be a B plus, A minus. Then we have Sahili. Sadly, no Felidar to go with Sahili for the infinite combo, but uh, we still get the Planeswalker at least. So it's a 3 mana Planeswalker in the Izzet colors, starts out at 3 loyalty, and the plus 1 lets us scry 1, and then Sahili deals 1 damage to each opponent. Then the minus 2 makes a token, that's a copy of target artifact or creature you control, except it will be an artifact in addition to its other types, and that token also gains haste and then we have to exile it at the beginning of the next end step. So we can maybe get a bit of value by copying a puzzle knot, which will enter the battlefield, and then uh, 
potentially leave something behind, can maybe sacrifice a puzzle knot or implement and uh, still get some value out of it before it goes away. So that's kind of where you want to have Sahili. And then a minus seven lets you search your library for up to t three artifact cards with different names and put them on the battlefield. So it's not too difficult to get to the ultimate if you just want to keep plussing and use a scry. So it's definitely a nice value planeswalker. It's going to be at its best in those improvised decks with plenty of cheap trinkets to sacrifice and play with. So Sahili is a solid card, um, but once again, it doesn't protect itself all that well. So not one of the better planeswalkers out there, but I still like a B for Sahili. Then we have a Spire Patrol, four mana for a 3-2 with flying in Azorius. And when the patrol enters the battlefield, tap target creature an opponent controls. And that creature doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. So just a nice kind of tempo play, making it difficult for the opponent to race. So yeah, I like a B for Spire Patrol as well. Uh, probably a lower end B than some of the other Bs we've given so far, but still quite strong. And then we have Tazeret, the Schemer, 4 mana for a Demir-colored Planeswalker at 5 loyalty. Can plus 1 to make a colorless artifact token named Ethereum Cell. It's essentially a treasure token. You can sacrifice it to add 1 mana of any color. The minus 2 says target creature gets plus X minus X until end of turn where X is the number of artifacts you control. So the more artifacts, the better. And then minus seven gives you an emblem saying at the beginning of combat on your turn, target artifact you control becomes an artifact creature with base, power, and toughness 5-5. Five, five. So that's not until end of turn. Starts out at five loyalty, so you can plus twice and then minus seven, and that will usually win the game. So Tesseret doesn't mess around and uh, also has a bit of built-in removal as long as you have enough artifacts in play to make use of it. Not all that great at taking out vehicles, but that's going to be the case for any sorcery speed removal, of course. Can still potentially take out the creatures that are crewing the vehicles. But uh, yeah, still a powerful planeswalker and definitely a bit better than Dovin and Sahili. So I'll give Tesseret an A. And then Tesseret's Touch is a 3-mana enchantment aura that can only enchant artifacts. And then the enchanted artifact is a creature with base power and toughness 5-5 five, five in addition to its other types. And when the enchanted artifact is put into a graveyard, we can return that card to its owner's hand. So ideally, you can just play a random two mana artifact and then play Tesseret's Touch on turn three, and that will start beating down very hard. And uh, even if the opponent manages to eventually answer your Tesseret's Touch, they will uh, still return that artifact back to your hand. Uh, so the best answer to Tesseret's Touch is probably an enchantment aura that can prevent your creature from attacking, but there's not that many of those in the set. So yeah, Tesseret's Touch, kind of an unusual card for Demir, since Demir typically a bit more controlling and wants to play a long grindy game, whereas Tesseret's Touch is just a card you want to slam down on turn 3 to apply a ton of pressure. But it's still a very powerful card, so happy to give this a B. And Unlicensed Disintegration, card that has seen a ton of constructed play as well. When it was in standard, 3 mana for an instant add uncommon in a Rakdos, destroys target creature, and if you control an artifact, disintegration deals 3 damage to that creature's controller as well. So just a total blowout if you're playing an aggressive deck and you can kill something and deal 3 damage, and it's not too difficult to have some random artifacts laying around. So yeah, disintegration, B plus, A minus, one of the best removal spells printed in uh, Kaladesh for sure. Then we have a Veteran Motorist, 2 mana for a 3-1 Dwarf Pilot at Uncommon. When a motorist enters the battlefield you get to scry 2, and when a motorist crews a vehicle, that vehicle gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. So yeah, again, 3 power for just 2 mana, perfect for crewing vehicles, and we even get that plus 1 plus 1 bonus. Scry 2 can help you find your vehicles. So the motorist is awesome. One toughness does mean that there are a few cards that can maybe take it out easily, so I like B for Veteran Motorist. And then Voltaic Brawler, a 2-drop in Gruul. It's a 3-2 that when it enters the battlefield gives us 2 energy, 
and when the brawler attacks we can pay one energy to give it plus one plus one and trample until end of turn so it acts as a 4-3 trampler for just two mana so beats down incredibly hard also saw play in the uh, pummeler decks which were the red green energy beatdown combo decks so definitely nice one there and for limited also just an awesome card so i like b maybe even b plus for voltaic brawler one of the better two drops out there Weltfast Engineer is a 3 mana 3-3 three, three human artificer in Rakdos and Uncommon. And at the beginning of combat on your turn, target artifact creature you control become or gets plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. So it can pump one of our vehicles as long as we make sure to uh, crew it before the uh, beginning of combat. Yeah, it can also just pump up small creature tokens that are artifacts and turn those into actual threats. So Engineer doesn't mess around. And also good at crewing vehicles himself, so we can first crew a vehicle and then give it plus two plus so with the engineer's ability. So very good card in any sort of aggressive artifact deck in Heraktos Colors. So I like a B for engineer as well. Most of these multicolor cards ended up at around B. Of course, some of them are going to be slightly better based on the composition of your deck. Whirler Virtuoso, three mana for a two three Vidalcan Artificer. In the Izzet colors, and when the Virtuoso enters the battlefield, you get 3 energy, and you can pay 3 energy to make a 1 1 colorless Thopter artifact creature token with flying. So by itself, 2 3 joined by a 1 1 flyer, so already very good. Of course, saw a ton of play in the Teamer energy decks. Also works quite nicely with all those modules we've seen earlier that trigger when creatures enter the battlefield or when we make energy. So Virtuoso is awesome. Uh, B plus, of course it is a two color card, uh, so it's not always the easiest to play, but if you can pair this with other energy producing cards and make a few Thopters, that's a great way to spend your energy. And then Winding Constrictor, a black and a green for a 2-3 snake at uncommon, and if one or more counters would be put on an artifact or creature you control, that many plus one of each of those counters are put on that permanent instead. And if you would get one or more counters, you get that many counters plus one as well. So it also works with energy counters, is what we're trying to point out here. So Constrictor, awesome in the Golgari decks that have a lot of plus one counter synergy. Great with energy as well. And I'm uh, expecting this to see a bit of play in Historic as well. So overall, awesome card. Two manas, incredibly cheap to get out there. And a 2-3 two, for two manas already, pretty decent, so... Yeah, this might sneak into the A category. It might slither its way into an A minus. Definitely an awesome card. Aerial Responder, three mana for a two three dwarf soldier at uncommon with flying vigilance and life link. So reminiscent of a vampire nighthawk trades death touch for vigilance, which is a downgrade, but Responder still quite strong. And uh, yeah, I'm happy giving Responder B plus. Just an awesome. Creature in white makes it very difficult to race and potentially has some dwarf synergies as well. Then we have Aeronaut Admiral, a 4 mana 3 1 human pilot at uncommon. It flies and vehicles we control have flying as well. So, of course, pairs quite nicely with some of the vehicles we've seen, especially thinking of some of the vehicles that can trade off easily, like the Dragster, the 6 1, that could otherwise. Uh, be traded away pretty easily. So those will pair quite nicely with the Admiral. And uh, yeah, just a 3-1 flyer by itself can also get in some damage and can also crew vehicles at 3 power. If you don't have any vehicles whatsoever, it's not that exciting. So it falls somewhere between a C plus and a B, depending on how many vehicles you have. Then we have Ether Inspector. A 4 mana 2-3 with Vigilance, and when it enters the battlefield you get 2 energy, and when the Inspector attacks you can pay 2 energy to make a 1-1 Servo Artifact creature token. So 2-3 Vigilance, not the easiest to attack unopposed, so it's going to be kind of tough to get those uh, Servo tokens from the Inspector. So this is definitely one of the weaker energy creatures that we'll see at common. Uh, so this one probably just gets a C from me. Then Aetherstorm Rock is a 4-mana 3-3 bird at rare. It flies, 
and when the rock or another creature enters a battlefield under your control, you get one energy, so can accumulate a ton of energy. And when the rock attacks, you may pay two energy to put a plus one plus one counter on it and tap up to one target creature defending player controls. Yeah, you play the rock, you get one energy. On the following turn, play another creature, get an another energy. And the rock should be able to attack unopposed and attack as a 4-4 as well. So even though white might not be the energy color, it does kind of work by itself without needing any other help. Yeah, the rock seems quite strong, probably an A. We've got airdrop aeronauts, 5 mana for a 4-3 dwarf scout at uncommon. It flies and has revolt, saying when the aeronauts enters the battlefield, if a permanent we controlled left the battlefield, we gain 5 life. So, yeah, you can attack, maybe make some trades, play this in your second main phase, and then you get a 4-3 flyer that gains 5. That's definitely a pretty good deal. If you don't gain the 5 life, it's still decent, but you're definitely aiming to enable Revolt here, one way or the other. So what do we give Aeronauts? Probably a B. Maybe in the high B range. Then we have Alley, Evasion, 1 mana for an instant. And we can choose one between target creature gets plus 1 plus 2 until end of turn, or return target creature you control to its owner's hand. So that is potentially a way to enable Revolt can save a creature from removal. The pump spell only being plus one plus two is not that exciting. Um, so I'm not super high on alley evasion, but if you have a lot of creatures with cool enter the battlefield abilities that you can maybe pick back up with alley evasion, it also gets a bit better. So this is probably just a C and uh, you might include it in some white decks. Ooh, Angel of Invention. 5 mana for a 2-1 Angel at Mythic, but it has Flying, Vigilance, Lifelink. Other creatures you control get plus 1 plus 1, and this is our first instance of Fabricate 2. So Fabricate 2 means when the Angel enters the battlefield, we can either put 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, which turns it into a 4-3 Flyer with Vigilance and Lifelink, or we can decide to make 2 1-1 Artifact Creature Tokens named Servo. So, on the one hand, if you put the two counters on the Angel, you get a bit more advantage from the Flying Vigilance and Lifelink part, since you get this giant flyer that can gain a ton of life back. On the other hand, if you select the two Servo tokens, you make better use of the other creatures you control get plus one plus one, and you also play around removal a little bit better. So this is definitely an interesting card to play in Limited. I mean, both modes are going to be awesome, but depending on the situation, you might choose one over the other. And it's also an awesome card in Constructed. Also thinking of uh, Godfarer's Gift decks that can bring back the Angel, where it will be a 4-4 and still give other creatures plus one plus one, and you still get to make two servo tokens. So that's definitely a home for Angel of Invention. And uh, we've got some other new tools to potentially enable those blue-white Godfarer's Gift decks. So for limited Angel of Invention, definitely an A. I'm hesitant to give it an S, since it is still pretty easily answered, and at the end of the day, if they answer the Angel, you're just left with two 1-1 tokens, which is nice, but it's not necessarily going to win you the game, but it's definitely one of the better rares out there, so happy to give it an A. And then we've got Audacious Infiltrator, 2 mana for a 3-1 Dwarf Rogue, cannot be blocked by artifact creatures. So in some matchups, that's going to be a bit more relevant than in other matchups. But being a 2-mana 3-powered creature is still great at crewing vehicles. So that's where the Infiltrator is going to be at its best. So I think this is actually a C+, instead of just a C, just because of how good it is at crewing vehicles. And in some matchups, it's going to be pretty tricky to block for the opponent. Then we have Authority of the Consoles. 1-mana Enchantment at Rare. This was essentially a sideboard card against the red aggressive decks back in the day, and I don't think it's going to be any different here. So creatures your opponents control enter the battlefield tapped, so it's very good against haste creatures, and whenever a creature enters the battlefield under an opponent's control, you also gain one life. So strictly a, a sideboard card for constructed, and uh, can also have some other applications. Uh, for instance, if you're playing historic, against the Neoform combo decks, all the opponent's creatures will come into play tapped, so they can't kill you the turn they combo off. 
So that could potentially be a, an application of authority as well. And of course against aggressive red decks. But for limited, I would avoid this, so probably a D. Aviary Mechanic, 2 mana for a 2-2 two -two Dwarf Artificer. When it enters a battlefield, you may return another permanent you control to its owner's hand. So this is potentially a way to enable Revolt. As you get to pick up a permanent, it left the battlefield, so Revolt has been achieved. And uh, yeah, can potentially enable some more Enter the Battlefield abilities. Good with Fabricate, since you can potentially make more Servo Tokens. And uh, 2 mana 2-2 two -two is still okay. And both creature types are also relevant. So I like C plus for Aviary Mechanic. I think most white decks are going to be happy with it. Build to last. A 1 mana instant. Saying target creature gets plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. And if it's an artifact creature, it also gains indestructible until end of turn. So this is at its best when used with vehicles that are attacking. And will be an important combo trick to play around if the opponent's playing white mana. And is attacking with a vehicle. So yeah, in the vehicle aggressive decks, this is quite strong. If you're just using it for a plus two plus two, it's just okay. So probably just a C for build to last, but an important trick to play around. Cataclysmic Gear Hulk, the first of the Gear Hulk cycle. All of these are awesome. The white one might be one of the weaker ones compared to the other ones for limited at least. So this is 5 mana for a 4-5 mythic rare artifact creature construct with vigilance. And when the gear hulk enters the battlefield, each player chooses an artifact, creature, enchantment and a planeswalker from among their permanents and then sacrifices the rest. So the opponent still gets to keep their best vehicle and creature and uh, you have to kind of do the same. So it's, it's just okay, probably give this a B. And yeah, the important part here is that you can choose an artifact creature as either a creature or an artifact. So artifact creatures are easier to save with a gear hulk than uh, non-artifact creatures. Then we have Conviction, 2 mana for an enchantment aura. And that gives the enchanted creature plus 1 plus 3. And then for white mana we can return Conviction to its owner's hand. So this does a few things that might not be obvious at first uh, glance. So first off, of course, if you keep up the white mana, you can save your Conviction if your creature is about to die. Um, but the more important synergy with Conviction is that it's a great way to enable Revolt. So if you've got a deck with a ton of Revolt synergies, you can play Conviction and then pick it back up for one white mana. So you're essentially enabling Revolt for just one mana, which could be quite good. And then as long as you can keep your Conviction around, you can make sure to give your more important creature the plus plus one plus three bonus. So that being said, it's still kind of a clunky enchantment that doesn't add a ton of power. But uh, in a revolt heavy deck, it's definitely a card you want to try and pick up. So I'll give Conviction a C and the revolt decks are gonna want it quite highly. Then we have Countless Gears Renegade, two mana for a 2-2 two -two Dwarf Artificer with a revolt saying when it enters the battlefield we get to make a 1-1 one, one servo token if we achieve the revolt. So not always easy to enable revolt by turn 2. So unless you've got like a turn 1 renegade map to enable revolt on turn 2, you're probably not going to have it on turn 2 very often. But in later turns it shouldn't be too difficult to get the extra token out of it. And a 1-1 one, one artifact token definitely adds up with all the artifact synergies in the set. And by default, a 2-mana two 2-2 two two can be too bad. And again, both creature types are relevant. So I like a C for Countless Gears Renegade. But the Revolt decks might be able to make better use of it. Then we have a Dawn Feather Eagle, 5-mana for a 3-3 three three bird that flies. And when it enters the battlefield, creatures you control get plus 1 plus 1 and gain Vigilance until end of turn. This is an effect we've seen many times before. And it's always quite good. So this is going to be at its best in kind of the white fabricate decks that can make plenty of servo tokens. And uh, this is kind of the effect you want at 5 mana as opposed to the Selesnya plus 2 plus 2 and Vigilance to the team. Since you're actually adding a creature to the board. So I think this is going to be the preferred 5 mana anthem effect if you will. And uh, yeah, in those decks it's going to be quite good. And then a 3-3 three, three flyer is a nice leftover. So I like C+, plus B- minus for Dawnfeather Eagle, and uh, some of the go-wide decks are going to want it very highly. 
Then we have Addy Trailhawk, 2 mana for a 1-2 flyer. When it enters the battlefield you get 2 energy, and when the hawk attacks you can pay 1 energy, and if you do another target attacking creature gains flying until end of turn. So the hawk is kind of an important part to potentially assist other creatures that require attacking in order to enable some of their synergies. So let's say we have the hawk and another creature that needs to attack in order to maybe spend the energy to put a plus one counter on it, then the hawk is a perfect way to get that creature to attack without dying, so it can uh, keep enabling those synergies. So by itself the hawk, not that impressive, but in a dedicated energy deck with a lot of creatures that need to attack to potentially get some sort of bonus. Uh, we've seen the 2-3 earlier that makes a servo token, the hawk could be a way to sneak that creature into play so it can attack without dying. So that's kind of where I see the hawk being at its best. So yeah, the hawk's definitely a solid little creature and is one of the few kind of payoffs for energy in white. So I like C plus for the hawk, but if you don't have a ton of energy synergy, it probably is not a card you're super interested in, so not the best in the vehicle strategy for instance. Then we have Fairgrounds Warden, 2 and a white for a 1-3 Dwarf Soldier and Uncommon. And when it enters the battlefield you can exile target creature and opponent controls until the Warden leaves the battlefield. So yeah, this is a pretty strong card. Comes down, exiles a creature and then sticks around to potentially help you crew vehicles, etc. So there's a lot to like about Fairgrounds Warden, probably just a B solid creature and might even see some play in uh, Constructed as well. Then we have Fragmentize, a 1 mana sorcery that destroys an artifact or enchantment with converted mana cost 4 or less. So much like we saw those main deck naturalize effects in Theros, it's going to be the same with Fragmentize in Kaladesh. So this is a card you're typically happy to include one copy in the main deck, just as a cheap way to get rid of artifacts and enchantments. And while mostly it's going to be destroying artifacts, there's definitely a few enchantments and enchantment removal spells that you would not mind getting rid of. So yeah, Fragmentize, C+, definitely main deckable, but I would be wary of playing too many copies in the main deck because not every deck cares about artifacts as much as uh, the other one. And then we have Fumigate, a 5 mana sorcery at rare that destroys all creatures and you gain one life for each creature destroyed this way. So yeah, powerful effect, although with the caveat that it doesn't destroy vehicles unless they were crewed. So there's definitely a downside to Fumigate as opposed to other sets where this might be a clean board wipe. So not as good as it might seem at first glance. That being said, it's still quite powerful. And if the opponent doesn't expect it, it can be an absolute blowout. So I'll give Fumigate an A-. minus. This is definitely a solid card. And sweepers are typically quite strong and limited. Then we have Gearshift Ace, 2 mana for a 2-1 Dwarf Pilot at Uncommon, has first strike and when the Ace crews a vehicle, that vehicle also gains first strike until end of turn. So once again a great way to potentially give that 6-1 Trampler first strike and make it more difficult for the opponent to trade off. So that's where you want to try and use the Gearshift Ace and 2 mana 2-1 first strike already quite good. And uh, yeah, that ability definitely very useful in one of those vehicle heavy decks. So there's a lot to like about Gearshift Ace, probably C plus B minus. Of course the more vehicles you have the better, but even without vehicles it's still a playable card. A Glint's Leaf Artisan, 3 mana for a 2-2 Dwarf Artificer with Fabricate 1, so either a 3-3, so 2-2 with a plus 1 counter, or a 2-2 that also makes a 1-1 servo token. So depending on if you're a go wide deck or you care about plus one counters and the board state of course this uh, could be quite useful. So yeah just a solid playable um, fits into pretty much any wide deck and a great curve filler. So I like C plus for artisan. Then we have Herald of the Fair 3 mana 3 2 and when it enters the battlefield target creature you control gets plus one plus one until end of turn. Nothing fancy, just a curve filler at 3 mana. I like this a little bit less than the Artificer we've just seen, so I'll give this a C. Being a 3 mana, 3 powered creature is still okay when it comes to crewing vehicles at least. Then we have Impeccable Timing, 2 mana instant, that deals 3 damage to target attacking or blocking creature. So normally this card would be quite decent, 
The problem here is that 3 damage is not nearly enough to kill a lot of the vehicles in the set, so it doesn't necessarily kill the thing you care about. And of course it can't kill creatures that are crewing vehicles, because those won't be the ones attacking or blocking. So timing can definitely be awkward against the vehicle decks. Outside of the vehicle matchups it's fine, um, but still not exciting. So this is definitely one of the weaker, more conditional removal spells in the set. So I'll just give this a C, whereas you might give this a C plus in other environments. Inspire Charge, 4 mana, instant, giving creatures you control plus 2 plus 1 until end of turn. So this one's an actual instant. So going back to that Celestia multicolor cards, giving plus 2 plus 2 for 5 mana at sorcery speed, this might just be the better version and a nice payoff for the Go Wide Fabricate decks making a bunch of tokens. So I like C plus for Inspire Charge, a great finisher for the Go Wide token decks, but you probably don't want it outside of those. And sometimes it might be okay to play Inspire Charge at sorcery speed if you need to crew a vehicle, just as a side note. Then we have Master Trinketeer, 3 mana for a 3-2 Dwarf Artificer at a rare, giving Servos and Thopters you control plus 1 plus 1, and for 4 mana we get to make a 1-1 one, one Servo token. So awesome mana sync, great card by itself, and of course amazing in the Go White Servo token decks. So I like an A for Master Trinketeer, just uh, good on turn 3, and an awesome mana sync that the opponent will have to deal with, or it's just going to take over the game. Propeller Pioneer, 4 mana for a 2-1 flyer with Fabricate 1, so either a 3-2 flyer or a 2-1 that makes a 1-1 servo. Definitely a solid playable, I like C+, for Propeller Pioneer, another key card for the Fabricate decks. Then we have Refurbish, 4 mana sorcery at uncommon, saying return target artifact card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So this is going to be a key piece of the Godfarer's Gift decks in Historic, as it can potentially pick up a Godfarer's Gift from the graveyard, instead of having to actually go through the gate to the afterlife instead, and uh, could have some other combo potential, maybe reanimate an expensive artifact creature, who knows. Uh, for limited, it's not that exciting, since it requires a lot of setup, and yeah, it's just a bit conditional in nature. So for limited, this is probably closer to a D, but uh, definitely an awesome card for Constructed. A Restoration Specialist, 2 mana for a 2-1 Dwarf Artificer at Uncommon, and for 1 white mana we can sacrifice it to return up to 1 target artifact card and up to 1 target enchantment card from your graveyard to your hand. Now if there's not that many enchantments in Kaladesh, it's mostly about artifacts, so it's kinda tricky to get a clean 2 for 1 out of it, so it's not as exciting as it might seem at first glance, that being said, it's still potentially a way to enable Revolt by sacrificing it, and getting back an artifact could be useful if you've got a valuable artifact, like maybe a vehicle you want to get back. So, probably still give Specialist a C+, but uh, don't overrate it. Revoke Privileges. This is one of those key removal spells, two and a white for an enchantment aura that enchants a creature. The enchanted creature can't attack, block, or crew vehicles. That last part is incredibly relevant, otherwise this card would not nearly be as good as it is. But uh, preventing the crewing of vehicles means the opponent can't leverage their enchanted creature. And uh, yeah, this is a solid removal spell. Now it doesn't enchant uh, vehicles, it can only enchant creatures, so it's still not necessarily a great answer to a vehicle, but at, at the very least you're preventing the opponent from crewing the vehicle with the enchanted creature. So Revoke Privileges, just a B, Salt Removal spell. Then we have Servo Exhibition, 2 mana, Uncommon Sorcery, making 2 one, one Servo Creature Tokens. So this is an awesome way to get started with your Go White Fabricate deck that cares about making a bunch of tokens. Great way to enable Improvise as well, even if a lot of the Improvise synergies are in blue-red. You can maybe still splash some of your payoff cards or skew a bit more heavily towards white and get that Servo Exhibition in play early to get those two tokens for Improvise. So yeah, those tokens have a ton of synergy in the set, and uh, they're definitely a lot better than they might be in a different environment. So I like C plus for Servo Exhibition, very similar to the Puzzle Knot in terms of enabling Improvise, but potentially better for the Go White creature decks. 
Then we've got Sky Whaler's Shot, a 3 mana instant at uncommon that destroys target creature with power 3 or greater and lets you scry 1. So this is a great answer to vehicles, since it's an instant, so you can wait for the opponent to crew their vehicle, and then you get to take it out and even get to scry 1. So this card's awesome, definitely one of the better removal spells in the set, and I'm happy giving this a B+. Then we have Sram, Senior Edificer, 2 mana for a 2-2 Legendary Dwarf Advisor at rare, saying whenever you cast an aura, equipment or vehicle spell you get to draw a card. So not too many auras or equipment in the set, for limited but plenty of vehicles, so Sram is perfect for the vehicle decks. And of course this might have quite a few constructed applications in all sorts of core spirit dancer aura decks, or maybe some other combo decks. So there's a lot to like about Sram. I like a B for SRAM, just a 2-drop that kind of requires an immediate answer, otherwise you might get a few extra cards out of it, so the opponent's going to feel pressured into uh, getting rid of SRAM as soon as possible, which is a lot to ask for a 2-drop. Then we have SRAM's Expertise for mana sorcery at rare, making 3 one, one servo creature tokens, and then we can also cast a spell with converted mana cost 3 or less from our hand without paying its mana cost. The expertise is a kind of a cycle, so we're going to see one in each color, and they all have this ability of letting us cast a spell for free after the effect takes place. Going to be good in the go wide creature deck that wants to finish the game with an inspired charge, and might even see a bit of constructed play in token decks that uh, get to maybe put something powerful in play with a free spell. But uh, yeah, overall, powerful card. Um, probably give this a B, B. Plus. Then we have Thopter Arrest, 3 mana for an enchantment at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, exile target artifact or creature an opponent controls until Arrest leaves the battlefield. So this is finally an answer to vehicles, since it can exile artifacts. So this is kind of like your banishing light effect for the set, that gets rid of uh, both artifacts and creatures. So this one I kind of like more than the Arrest or uh, not the arrest or revoke privileges we've seen earlier. So this one's closer to a B plus than uh, revoke privileges is, but uh, they're both quite good. And then Toolcraft Exemplar has seen a lot of constructed play as well as a 1 mana 1-1 one, one Dwarf Artificer, and at the beginning of combat on your turn, if you control an artifact, Toolcraft Exemplar gets plus 2 plus 1 until end of turn, and if you control 3 or more artifacts, it also gains first strike until end of turn. So it's not that difficult to turn this into a 3-2 for one mana, and then uh, you can maybe even get it first strike later in the game as well. So Exemplar beats down incredibly hard, pairs quite nicely with vehicles as well, since you can still potentially crew a vehicle before you have to declare your creatures as attackers, as long as you sequence correctly. So yeah, Exemplar. Awesome for Constructed, in terms of Limited, it's still quite good alongside Vehicles as a 1 mana way to crew your Vehicles and uh, not too difficult to get an Artifact in play on turn 2 to turn it into a 3-2 right away, seen plenty of examples already. Yeah, Exemplar might get a B just because of the efficiency of the card. Next up we have a Visionary Augmenter, a 4 mana 2-1 Dwarf Artificer with Fabricate 2. So we either have a 4-3, or more likely a 2-1 that also makes two servo tokens. So another awesome card for the go wide token decks. So yeah, I like a B for Visionary Augmenter. Great card for the go wide token decks. Then we have Wisp Weaver Angel, 6 mana for 4 Angel at Uncommon, it flies. And when it enters the battlefield, you can exile another target creature you control and return it to the battlefield under its owner's control. So it essentially flickers one of our creatures, which is awesome with the Fabricate cards. So you do want to make sure to choose the mode that makes the servo tokens instead of the plus one counters if you're planning to flicker the creature afterwards with Wisp Weaver Angel. But yeah, that's potentially another servo token or potentially two servo tokens thanks to the Angel. Can maybe save a creature that's underneath an enchantment. So there's a lot going for it, and then a 4-4 flyer can also end the game pretty quickly. So I like B for Wisp Weaver Angel, even if it's a little pricey, but uh, white decks are going to be able to make good use of it. Yeah, that's a good point. It also enables Revolt 
So if you're flickering a creature with revolts, it kind of enables revolts by itself. That's also a great interaction to point out. So our first blue card, Ether Meltdown. Two mana for an enchantment aura with flash add on common, so we can play it at instant speed and it enchants both a creature or a vehicle, which is definitely a pretty big deal in this set. And when Meltdown enters the battlefield, we also get two energy, which is always a nice bonus. And then the enchanted permanent gets minus four minus O. So that's a permanent enchantment. It will stay on the vehicle. So even if it's no longer a creature, it will still stay on there. Yeah, the fact that it also makes energy is definitely useful in blue, which is one of the colors that cares more about energy than uh, most. So I like Aether Meltdown quite a bit. Probably give this a B. The fact that it's an instant, thanks to Flash, also means it can potentially be a blowout in the middle of combat. Then we have Aether Swooper, 2 mana common, the Dalkan Artificer, and it's a 1-2 flyer that generates 2 energy when it enters the battlefield. And when the Swooper attacks, we can pay 2 energy to make a 1-1 one, one servo token. So the Swooper, unlike the uh, white counterpart we've seen, is much easier to attack with and spend the 2 mana or the, the 2 energy to make the servo token. So it's, it's definitely easy to get in with a Swooper and make a few servo tokens. And uh, yeah, once you build up your army of servo tokens, you can use those with maybe your improvised cards or other cards that care about artifacts. So there's a lot to like about Aether Swooper. So I'm happy giving this a C+. It's definitely one of the better commons in the set. Then we have Aether Theorist, 2 mana for a 1-3, that when it enters the battlefield generates 3 energy. And then we can tap the Theorist and pay 1 energy to scry 1. So by itself we get 3 uses for the scry 1 effect, which isn't too bad. But of course it also plays well with other energy cards, potentially helping us make energy for other potential uses. So the Theorist is great in the energy decks. Outside of the energy decks it's not super exciting, as a 1-3 that doesn't crew vehicles all that well. But the scry 1 effect definitely adds up. So I like a C for Theorist, but the energy decks might take it quite highly. Then we have Aether, Trade Winds, 3 mana for an instant, that returns target permanent you control and target permanent you don't control to their owner's hands. So it can bounce maybe a vehicle after the opponent crewed it, and maybe bounce back a creature with a sweet enter the battlefield ability. So that's kind of the best case scenario. Or it can maybe free a creature that was locked underneath an enchantment. So Trade Winds can do a lot of different things. And uh, yeah, there's no shortage of cool enter the battlefield effects to leverage a second time with Trade Winds. So I like a, a C for Trade Winds. It's probably still not a card you want too many copies of in your deck. Uh, since it is kind of a tempo negative play of having to pick up your card again. But usually you can get good value out of it and I'm happy to have the first copy in most blue decks. Then we have Baral, Chief of Compliance, 2 mana for a 1-3 legendary human wizard. At rare, making instants and sorcery spells, we cast one less. Whenever a spell or ability we control counters a spell, we can draw a card and if we do, discard a card. So Baral, incredibly annoying uh, commander in Brawl. If we're ever going to see some more historic brawl, may even get banned, who knows. But uh, for limited, uh, it's definitely still a pretty decent card in the uh, decks that focus mostly on instants and sorceries, which, to be honest, there's not that many in Kaladesh, since it's a set that cares more about artifacts. There's not too many counter spells to leverage the second line of text with Baral, so it's definitely more of a powerhouse in Constructed than it is in Limited. Uh, so for limited, probably give this a C+. I don't envision this being too broken, but uh, still definitely nice to drop that can play defense and discount some of your more expensive spells like Barl's Expertise maybe, the 5 mana rare sorcery counterpart that returns up to 3 target artifacts and or creatures to their owner's hands, and then we can cast a spell with converted mana cost 4 or less from our hand without paying its mana cost. This was also kind of a key part of the blue Aetherflux Reservoir combo deck, as you could maybe uh, have the uh, three mana artifact to give expertise improvise, so you could cast it for just double blue and then still cheat a four mana artifact in play like Aetherflux Reservoir. I don't think we got the three mana artifact to give non-artifact spells improvise, sadly, so we might not see that combo deck 
Uh, but that being said, Brawl's Expertise, still a pretty awesome card that uh, is kind of a tempo blowout almost. Being able to return vehicles as well is pretty key. And then we essentially get to bounce three things and still spend for additional mana, all just for five mana total. So if you're any sort of tempo deck trying to close out the game quickly, Brawl's Expertise is going to make it very difficult for the opponent to come back. That being said, blue decks typically a bit more controlling and don't always look to end the game quickly. So this is probably going to be at its best in, let's say, a blue-red deck that's a bit more aggressive, or maybe blue-white, as opposed to, let's say, a blue-black deck that's more controlling. But uh, yeah, Expertise still quite strong, happy giving this a B. Then we have Ceremonious Rejection, 1 mana instant and uncommon that counters target colorless spell. So perfect for countering expensive vehicles. And most decks are going to have a couple artifacts at the very least. So Rejection, unlike Fragmentize, is a card you're a bit more hesitant to include in the main deck. Because it's a bit more conditional in nature if you draw it later. It's not always going to be uh, countering the thing you want to. And uh, whereas Fragmentize can still maybe kill a random servo token that the opponent got even from a non-artifact card, uh, Rejection specifically only counters colorless spells, which in this set means artifact spells since there's no Eldrazi roaming around, at least not yet. So Rejection, um, it's like a playable main deck card, but an awesome sideboard card if your opponent has a lot of powerful and especially expensive artifacts they want to play because it's not too difficult to keep up one blue mana. I like C for Rejection, but it could be a, an, an A in terms of how powerful it could be as a sideboard card in some matchups. So the value definitely fluctuates quite a bit, but again, not every deck necessarily has a ton of artifacts. Then we have Confiscation Coup, 5 mana sorcery at rare, and you can choose target artifacts or creature, and you get 4 energy, and then you can pay any amount of energy equal to that permanence convert mana cost, and if you do, you gain control of it. So it's a little bit complicated in how it's worded, but essentially if you have enough energy, you get to steal whatever you want, and you get 4 energy to start with, but if you had more energy, you could potentially steal something bigger, and if you steal something smaller, you might have some leftover energy. So Confiscation Coup is great, um, mind control effects are always great and limited, this can even steal vehicles, so it's just an awesome 2 for 1. Happy giving this an A, and uh, most blue decks are going to have other sources of energy to potentially steal bigger stuff too. Then we have Disallow, 3 mana instant at rare, counter target spell, activated ability, or triggered ability. So for limited, we mostly care about countering a spell, so it's kind of like a cancel with a bit of upside. There's quite a few triggered and activated abilities running around, so that could definitely come up in Constructed. Being able to counter abilities is also quite nice when facing Planeswalkers. For instance, you can maybe counter someone's ultimate from a Planeswalker. I remember in Standard, you had to be careful when ultimating your Chandra Torch of Defiance and maybe plus one an extra turn when playing against blue decks to prevent a disallow blowout. But uh, yeah, for limited three mana counter spell, uh, it's a fine card, just a C plus. Not much better than Cancel. Era of Innovation, 2 mana, enchantment at uncommon, and whenever an artifact or artificer enters a battlefield under your control, you can pay 1 mana, and if you do, you get 2 energy, and then you can pay a total of 6 energy, and sacrifice Era of Innovation to draw 3 cards. So, Era of Innovation, you could very quickly try and get to 6 energy and then sacrifice it right away, or you can kind of keep it around to potentially use it to produce more energy for your other energy payoffs. It does want to go in a pretty specific deck with a lot of artificers and artifacts. So not every blue energy deck necessarily is going to be able to uh, leverage Arrow of Innovation. So I wouldn't take it super highly, but uh, yeah, in some decks that uh, have the right setup for it, it could be a nice draw three effect can potentially play nicely with all your modules, so that's probably a deck where you want to take innovation highly. So I'll give this a, a C, maybe C+. It does require a pretty specific deck to be good. Then we have Gear Seeker Serpent, 7 mana for a 5-6 Serpent at common, costs 1 less to cast for each artifact you control. 
So this is not really like improvise, it's kind of more like affinity, the old keyword that uh, gives you a discount for artifacts in play. And uh, then for six mana, the serpent cannot be blocked this turn. So in decks that can quickly add some artifact tokens to the board maybe with fabricate, with the puzzle knots, you could potentially get a serpent in play quite early, maybe as early as turn four. And then you'll have to wait a little bit to use the unblockable ability, but in the meantime you've got a 5-6, a great at crewing vehicles, can attack maybe once or twice, can play defense nicely. And then once you do get to the late game where you have 6 mana, if there's any sort of board stall, this is just going to end the game very quickly. So I definitely have a lot of fond memories of Gear Seeker Serpent, and I'm happy giving this a C+. Then we have a Glimmer of Genius, 4 mana instant at uncommon. Let's use Scry 2 and then draw 2, and you get 2 energy to boot. So this is definitely a nice card draw effect. I've cast many Glimmer of Genius back in the day with Torrential Gear Hulk as well. So potentially a nice one for the energy control decks out there. And uh, yeah, just a, an awesome 2 for 1. The energy is super useful. Scry 2, draw 2 lets you dig pretty deep. So this is an awesome card draw spell for any blue deck. And even if you don't have any use for the energy, it's still okay. So I like B for Glimmer of Genius. A Glint Nest Crane, 2 mana for a 1-3 bird at Uncommon. It flies, and when it enters the battlefield, you get to look at the top 4 cards of your library, reveal an artifact card from among them, and put it into your hand. So Glint Nest Crane, potentially a way to search for your various combo pieces in Constructed, if you've got some sort of artifact synergy deck. For limited, you'll have to be careful with playing the crane since you're not always going to have enough artifacts for it to be worth it. So these cards are often a little bit uh, deceiving in how awkward they end up being since you might not have enough targets for it. So I don't know the exact numbers of artifacts you would need to have to uh, potentially play the crane, but it's probably higher than you think it is. A 1-3 flyer for 2... You know, it still blocks, but it doesn't crew vehicles all that well. So it's definitely not exciting. Um, so I think Glynnes Crane is probably closer to a C, and you'll have to be very careful with uh, including it, since you might need more artifacts than you think you need. Then we have Hinterland Drake, a 3-mana 2-3 flyer that cannot block artifact creatures. Not the best at crewing vehicles, um, so it's kind of an awkward creature that doesn't synergize all that well with what's going on in the set. But it's still, like, okay, it's definitely playable. Um, we're kind of used to seeing 3-mana 2-2 two -two flyers, and those are usually playable. So this is a little bit better, depending on the context. So probably give Drake a C plus still. Um, but just uh, keep in mind that the downside is definitely real. Then we have Ice over, 2-mana for an enchantment aura at common. Enchants an artifact or creature, so once again could potentially enchant a vehicle, and the enchanted permanent doesn't untap during its controller untap step. Now it doesn't tap the permanent down to begin with, so kind of have to take a first hit before you can lock something down, which is a pretty big downside. So I'm not super high on ice over, but it is still very cheap to play for just two mana, so it helps you double spell and maybe catch back up if you're behind. But uh, yeah, having to take a hit first doesn't always feel good. So I'll give this a C+. Plus. Still a removal spell you're going to include in most decks. Then we have Illusionist's Stratagem, a 4-mana instance at Uncommon that exiles up to two target creatures you control, and you return those to the battlefield under their owner's control, and you get to draw a card. It's a bit of an awkward card. Uh, essentially, just flickers two of your creatures, so if those creatures have awesome enter the battlefield abilities, that's great. If you can flicker a cloud blazer, you get an achievement unlocked. Good with fabricate, so this is going to be at its best in blue-white. If you don't have a lot of ETB creatures, it's kind of awkward to keep up for mana, to try and chump block and then use it. That's another way you can potentially leverage it, by just kind of chumping the opponent's creature and then flickering your creature so it doesn't die, and potentially generate a bit of value. So... I don't remember this making the main deck very often, but uh, yeah, in a blue-white flicker deck it could be fine. So I'll give this a C, just uh, kind of clunky, but potentially has quite a bit of value behind it. 
Then we have a Leaf in the Dust for mana for an instant that returns a non-land permanent to its owner sand, and you get to draw a card. So this was definitely a, a pretty nice bounce spell. You can kind of compare it to a Kicked into the Royal. That's a pretty good card. Don't have the flexibility of playing it for two mana, but still four mana to bounce something, including potentially a vehicle after the opponent crewed it, and draw a card is a great tempo play. So I think I like uh, B- minus for Leave in the Dust, C plus B- minus somewhere in that range. Malfunction for mana, Enchantment Aura, that enchants an artifact or creature. And when Malfunction enters the battlefield, we tap Enchant a permanent and it doesn't untap during its controller's untap step. So very similar to Ice Over, we have to pay two additional mana, but then we do get to tap the thing down right away. So pretty clunky at four mana but it does get the job done, has a downside of potential flicker effects being able to free the uh, enchanted permanence, so there's definitely some downsides, and there might be some effects that let the opponent sacrifice an artifact to get some value, so if you're enchanting uh, a vehicle for instance, the opponent might still get some good value out of it. So not a huge fan of malfunction, but it is playable, so somewhere in the C, C plus range. Metallic Rebuke, 3 mana instant, at common, and it has Improvise, so we can tap our artifacts to help pay for Rebuke to potentially let it cost a single blue mana. can only contribute towards a generic mana cost and not the actual blue mana, so it's always going to cost at least one blue mana. And then Counter Target Spell, unless its controller pays 3 mana, so just a nice counter spell that's potentially easy to keep up if you've got a ton of artifacts, but it does drop off in the late game pretty quickly as uh, most mana leak effects do. So I like a C for Rebuke, not particularly exciting, but in the right deck it could be some pretty key interaction to stay alive. Then we have Metallurgic Summonings, a 5 mana enchantment at Mythic, saying whenever we cast an instant or sorcery spell we get to make an XX colorless construct artifact creature token where X is that spells convert a mana cost. So this sticks around and potentially generates a ton of tokens, and for 5 mana we can exile the summonings and return all instant and sorcery cards from our graveyard to our hand, and we can only activate this if we control 6 or more artifacts. So for limited, again, this set doesn't have that many instants and sorceries to leverage the summonings, so you'll have to be careful with not overestimating it compared to other sets. Uh, definitely a fun build around for Constructed, even if it's going to be a little slow, so probably more for the casual formats. But uh, yeah, for Limited, if you can build your deck around it, if you picked it early, it can definitely do a lot of work. If those tokens do add up, it's kind of similar to Shark Typhoon in uh, what it does. But uh, again, you're not going to have that many instances and sorceries to go with it, so probably closer to a B than uh, anything else but in a regular set it might have been a little bit higher. Then we have Minister of Inquiries, 1 mana, 1, 2, Vidalcan Advisor at Uncommon. Enters a battlefield, generates 2 energy, and we can tap and spend 1 energy to mill target player for 3. So this is going to be a key piece in the various uh, Graveyard Synergy decks in Constructed. can maybe help with uh, putting your Godfather's Gift in the Graveyard, although maybe there's better ways of doing it nowadays. But uh, yeah, for limited, I do remember this sometimes being a win condition. If you had an energy deck that kind of lacked a good finisher to end the game, you could sometimes just mill someone out with Minister of Inquiries, especially if you got multiple copies. It's also very cheap, so going back to that uh, module we've seen a while ago that can pick up creatures again, this is a cheap one mana creature to replay to generate a ton of energy and then you can potentially spend that energy somewhere else, you don't have to use it to melt the opponent. So in kind of the energy synergy decks, this could be both a way to generate energy and a way to potentially win the game. Outside of those decks, it doesn't do much, so I'll give a Minister a C, and uh, it only really goes into some specific decks. Nimble Innovator, a 4 mana 2-2, Vidalcan Artificer, when it enters the battlefield you get to draw a card. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. A little bit on the small side, so if you're getting run over by vehicles, spending 4 mana on a 2-2 is not always where you want to be. But it's playable, uh, so I'll give this a C. Not quite as good as the Visionary from Zendikar, 
Padim Console of Innovation for mana 1 for Legendary Vidalcan Artificer, saying artifacts we control have hexproof, so we can protect our key vehicles, for instance. And at the beginning of our upkeep, if we control the artifact with the highest converted mana cost or tied for the highest, we get to draw a card. So it both protects our artifacts and then also helps us draw cards if we've got the biggest one in play. So yeah, Padim could be a pretty nice card draw engine. Just got to make sure to have some expensive artifacts in the deck and then you should be good to go. So I like a B for Padim. Bit slow, but can definitely win the game if it keeps on drawing cards. Paradoxical Outcome for mana instant at a rare and can return any number of target non-land, non-token permanents you control to their owner's hand and then draw that many cards or essentially draw cards for each permanent we returned this way. So this is definitely a powerful card in eternal formats where you can play it alongside a bunch of uh, zero mana artifacts. In limited it could still be kind of a nice draw engine and a way to reset some creatures with ETB effects. So this playable um, can maybe pick up those uh, cheap puzzle knots and then re-enable the enter the battlefield abilities. So outcome's definitely a playable card, uh, but it, you do want to play it in a deck with a lot of ETB effects and preferably cheap artifacts. So I'll give outcome a B. Then we have revolutionary rebuff, two mana instant, counters target non-artifact spell unless its controller pays two. I don't recall this seeing a ton of play in limited back in the day. Don't think it's going to be much different. The fact that it misses out on artifacts is a big deal. So I think this is just a D. Select for inspection is our unsummon effect in the set. One mana instant that returns a tapped creature to its owner's hand and we get to scry one. So you can wait for the opponent to attack with their creature and then bounce it. You can also tap your own creature with it. So it's not limited to only the opponent's creatures and then scry one is a nice bonus. So it's going to be a little awkward if the opponent's creature has vigilance because then you won't be able to bounce it. But for the most part, Select for Inspection is a nice one mana interactive spell and you're usually happy to have the first copy. So I like C plus for Select for Inspection. Shielded Aether Thief, two mana for an O4 with flash and when a thief blocks you get one energy. So you can wait for the opponent to attack with a three powered creature for instance flash it in and get one free energy and then you can tap the thief and pay three energy to draw a card so this is a pretty nice energy sink if you've got other creatures that make energy the opponent's probably not going to attack into the thief uh, after the first time unless they can maybe get significant amounts of damage in so it does also disincentivize the opponent from like chipping in with a bunch of tokens let's say you've got an ether thief and the opponent has uh, three 1-1 one, one tokens in play. They might not want to attack with all the tokens and give you one energy even if it means they could get in two damage. So it does have a pretty nice effect on the board against the uh, go wide decks and overall just a nice two drop. So I'm happy, happy giving this a C plus. And then Shipwreck More, four mana for an O5 fish that when it enters the battlefield it gives us four energy and we can pay one energy to give it plus two minus one or plus two minus two until end of turn. So it turns into a two three and then turns into a four one. So it can potentially hit pretty hard and uh, yeah it does get quite a bit of energy when it comes into play. So another way to potentially generate energy and spend it somewhere else and then still have an O5 that can maybe uh, get a bit of additional power. So a very versatile card. Probably only want it in the energy synergy decks if you never generate any additional energy and only get four activations, it's a bit medium. So I'll give this a C, definitely a playable card, but uh, gonna get better the more energy cards you have. Shrewd Negotiation, a five mana sorcery at uncommon that says exchange control of target artifact you control and target artifact or creature you don't control. So you do need to have an artifact can't get around it, but you can both steal an opposing artifact or an opposing creature. So ideally you can just give away a random 1-1 one -one token or maybe a puzzle knot that already generated a bit of value and then you get to steal the opponent's best creature or artifact. So negotiation is quite strong and uh, definitely cannot be underestimated. If the opponent has a bomb then uh, you just get to steal it, so the uh, blowout potential with negotiation is quite high. 
but you do need a little bit of setup. Make sure you have a few artifacts in play to trade away, otherwise it's not going to work. So I like B, B plus for negotiation. It requires a bit of setup, but the payoff is definitely there. Skyship Plunderer, a 2 mana 2-1 two human pirate with flying add on common. And when the Plunderer deals comma damage to a player, for each kind of counter on target permanent or player, give that permanent or player another counter of that kind. We get to potentially gain more energy if the Plunderer hits. We potentially get to add more plus one counters to our creatures. But blue, not really the color that has a ton of plus one counters. Uh, being a 2-1 flyer means it can get in quite a bit of damage in the air. Uh, could be awkward if the opponent can generate some Thopter tokens to block it. But uh, yeah, it's uh, a nice way to kind of proliferate onto our author permanence, which is always nice. So yeah, I'll, I'll happily give Plunderer C+. Tesseret's Ambition, 5 mana sorcery. That lets us draw 3, and if we control no artifacts, we discard a card. So you do want an artifact in play. Ambition's kind of expensive at 5 mana. Don't recall casting this too often, even though I like drawing cards quite a bit. So I think this didn't end up making the deck usually. Um, so it probably means this is closer to a D, but every now and then you might include it. I think the problem was also that the format is pretty fast. Vehicles are quite punishing, so you can't always sit back and draw cards uh, when there's a vehicle attacking you for six. So that's kind of part of the problem with ambition. So you usually want kind of the cheaper improvised card draw spells that are uh, a bit cheaper to play. Thriving Turtle, so this is the first of the Thriving Cycle. So 1 mana 03, when it enters a battlefield you get 2 energy, and when the turtle attacks you can pay 2 energy to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. So this might seem innocuous, but it gets out of hand very quickly, especially if you've got other sources of energy and uh, can keep growing the turtle. In the energy beatdown decks, typically blue-green, the turtle is going to be quite strong. Sometimes just putting one counter on it and turning it into a 1-4 can disincentivize the opponent from attacking with servo tokens. And sometimes that's all it takes to buy yourself a lot of time. And then eventually uh, you can maybe use the energy somewhere else as well. So yeah, turtle. I like a C for the turtle. It's still not a bomb or anything, but plays better than it may seem at first glance, that's for sure. And then Torrential Gearhulk is a blue Gearhulk. Definitely quite a bit better than the white one we've seen. So 6 mana, 5, 6, flash, artifact creature construct at mythic. And when a Gearhulk enters battlefield, we can cast target instant card from our graveyard without paying its mana cost. And then we have to exile it as well. So depending on how many powerful instants you have in the deck, the Gearhulk will get better. But it's still a 6 mana, 5, 6 that can often ambush an opposing creature. So it can never be too bad. Might even see some constructed play. So yeah, Gearhulk might get an S rating here just because of how powerful it is. It is 6 mana, so it is pricey, but uh, it is incredibly impactful. So I'll give Gearhulk an S. Trophy Mage, 3 mana for a 2-2 human wizard at uncommon. When Trophy Mage enters the battlefield, we can search for library for an artifact card with converted mana cost 3. Exactly 3. Reveal it, put it into our hand, and then shuffle. So... If you're drafting Trophy Mage, of course you've got to be on the lookout for artifacts with CMC3. Constructed could also combine this with the Gate to the Afterlife as a nice tutor target to make sure you can find your gate every game. So it definitely has some constructed applications as well. But uh, for limited, as long as you can pick up a nice handful of 3 mana artifacts, the Trophy Mage is a nice 2 for 1. So I like C plus for Trophy Mage and depending on how many three mana artifacts that have various effects you can pick up it might go up in value so the more variety in the three mana artifacts you can find the better it gets then we have weldfast wingsmith four mana for a three three human artificer at common saying whenever an artifact enters a battlefield under your control the wingsmith gains flying until end of turn this is a playable card but it's not exciting it is a little bit pricey at four mana uh, but it does have three powers, so it can crew vehicles, and then it can maybe get in some evasive damage later. This is just a C, just a fine playable, but nothing exciting. 
And then Windkin Raiders, 6 mana for a 4-3 Human Artificer at Uncommon. It flies and it has Improvise, so could potentially just cost double blue as long as we can tap for artifacts. So can potentially get it in play quite soon if we have a lot of cheap artifacts to help us pay for Improvise. So yeah, I like a B for the Raiders. It's a bit of a build around and it's not going to be amazing in any deck. But assuming you draft the Raiders and you have a few artifacts to get the Raiders in play quickly, it's uh, definitely a pretty sizable threat. And then War of Invention, X and Triple Blue for an instant with Improvise at rare. Let's us search our library for an artifact card with CMC X or less and put it on the battlefield. So pretty expensive to uh, get it going if we can't tap a ton of artifacts for Improvise. Uh, this is probably more of a constructed card that can help you enable some combos. For limited, yeah, I mean, it's kind of clunky. Uh, probably don't have that many key artifacts that you need to find with War of Invention. And even if you do, you're probably paying a bit too much mana for it. So I'm not a huge fan of War of Invention, probably just a C. First card is Ether Poisoner, another one of the cycle of creatures that generate energy and you can spend two energy to get a servo token. So this is a two mana 1-1 one, one death touch, makes two energy and then yeah, spend two energy when it attacks to make a servo token. So this one's maybe a little bit more difficult to attack with than the Ether Swooper, the 1-2 flyer in blue. Uh, that being said, it's still quite good. 1-1 one, one death touch, perfect for blocking a giant vehicle to prevent it from trampling our face. And uh, every now and then, if the opponent has a large creature in play, you can sneak in with a Poisoner to maybe get a few servo tokens. So I like Poisoner quite a bit. C+, similar to Aether Swooper. I think they're close in power level. Aetherborn Marauder, 4 mana for a 2-2. Aetherborn Rogue and Uncommon. It has Flying and Lifelink. And when the Marauder enters the battlefield, move any number of plus one plus one counters from other permanents you control onto the Aetherborn Marauder. So definitely an interesting card. You're kind of putting all your eggs into one basket if you're putting a ton of counters on Marauder. But it does have Flying and Lifelink, so it's probably the best home for those plus one counters. So yeah, it's always an interesting decision of how much you want to uh, move onto the Marauder, but assuming the opponent's mostly empty-handed, you've given them a good chance to use removal, and they didn't seem to have any, then uh, the Marauder can easily win the game by itself. So it's higher risk, higher rewards most of the time. So I like C plus for Marauder, definitely has a lot of potential, especially in the black-green plus one plus one counter synergy decks. Ali Strangler, 3 mana for a 2-3 Aetherborn Rogue with Menace. The mana costs and the power and toughness are a little awkward here. Being only 2 power means it's not that great at crewing vehicles. 2-3 uh, Menace, not the best combination of stats. So not a huge fan of the Strangler, probably just a D. Daring Demolition, 4 mana sorcery at common that destroys a creature or vehicle. So this I remember being probably the best common in Aether Revolt. Don't know how it's going to stack up in Kaladesh Remastered, but uh, can't be that bad. So at the very least a B, which is a very efficient, powerful removal spell, often killing vehicles around the same mana cost and potentially some larger things as well. Then we have Defiant Salvager, 3 mana for a 2 to Aetherborn Artificer and can help us sacrifice an artifact or a creature to put a plus one plus one counter on the Salvager, but we can only use it at sorcery speed. So the cool thing about Salvager is that it gives us a sacrifice outlet. We've seen a few of those implements, for instance, that even have an effect when they end up in the graveyard, even without using the sacrifice ability itself. So those can potentially synergize with the Salvager. I uh, don't remember if there being a huge act of treason uh, type synergy in Kaladesh to then steal the opponent's stuff and sacrifice it. Although we might see maybe one act of treason effect. Uh, we'll see when we get to red. But uh, yeah, Salvager, it looks kind of mediocre, usually plays better than it looks, but it's still not amazing. So somewhere between a C and a C+, plus, depending on how many sacrifice synergies you have. Then we have Demon of Dark Schemes, 6 mana for a 5-5 five, five Demon and Mythic. It flies, and when it enters the battlefield, all other creatures get minus 2, minus 2 until end of turn. So that also includes your own creatures. 
So a little bit different than Massacre Worm there. And whenever another creature dies, you get one energy. And you can pay two and a black and pay four energy to put target creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. But it does enter tapped. So it can be any graveyard. Um, four energy is not that much, assuming you can kill a few creatures when this comes into play. So yeah, the Demon of Dark Schemes doesn't mess around. Six mana, five, five flyer has immediate impact. And if it sticks around, it can sometimes just completely take over the game. So this is somewhere between an A and an S. Uh, it is triple black, which isn't the easiest mana cost. And you're not always necessarily going to be able to use the four mana energy ability if not a ton of creatures died. So there's definitely spots where this is just going to be essentially a 5-5 five, five flyer for six with not much else. But sometimes it's going to be so much better than that. So definitely the high end of A, A+. Plus. Maybe not quite an S, but definitely gets close. Then we have Dai Young, 2 mana for a sorcery at common. Choose target creature, you get 2 energy, and then you may pay any number of energy to give it a creature minus 1, minus 1, until end of turn for each energy paid. So at the very least, without any author energy, it's 2 mana sorcery to give a creature minus 2, minus 2. And, you've got, and if you've got author sources of energy, it can potentially be more. And if you're killing a 1 toughness creature, maybe getting rid of a 1-1 one, one death touch, you can even have a leftover energy to spend somewhere else. So Da Young, definitely a solid removal spell, C plus at the very least, and the more energy the better. Then we have Embral Bruiser, one and a black for a 3-1 human warrior at uncommon. And the Bruiser enters tapped, so makes it a little awkward when it comes to crewing vehicles, since you can't crew a vehicle the turn you play it. And it has a menace as long as you control an artifact. So the Menace kind of wants it to attack instead of crewing vehicles. So it kind of lives in this weird space where it's both good with vehicles but also kind of bad. That being said, it's still just a fine two drop. Uh, menace means it's going to require multiple blockers. So if the opponent only has a one servo token, it's not going to be enough. They'll actually have to trade with multiple servos or an actual creature if they want to block this. So Bruce is still okay. Probably just a C plus but can be a little awkward when it comes into play tapped. Essence Extraction, one and double black for an instant at uncommon, dealing three damage to target creature and we gain three life. So yeah, nice removal spell. The life gain is definitely useful in a format that can often be aggressive. Uh, three damage, not always enough to kill a vehicle, but it can kill a creature that wants to crew a vehicle. So that's still pretty nice. Uh, so yeah, I like probably a B, B- minus for Essence Extraction. Uh, I think I'm taking the 4 mana common removal spell over it, the one that destroys a creature or vehicle, but this one's not too far behind. Then we have Fatal Push, 1 mana instant at uncommon, destroys a creature if it has CMC 2 or less, and Revolt means CMC 4 or less instead. So. In Limited, you shouldn't overestimate how easy it is to enable Revolt, because we don't have fetch lands to help us do that. Uh, that being said, black and kind of black-whites, maybe Absalom to an extent, those are kind of the colors that have the most Revolt synergy, so that's where Fatal Push is going to be at its best. And yeah, it does potentially kill a 4-mana creature for just 1 mana. If you can enable Revolt in the opponent's turn, it can also take out vehicles that the opponent's attacking with. So it does have a lot of upside, but you do sometimes have to work for it, and just killing a 2-mana creature for 1-mana is fine, but it's nothing exciting. Gonna be awesome in Constructed, no doubt, even without too many fetch lands as opposed to Modern. For Limited, it's just a fine card, probably B, B-. I think I'm still taking the common 4-mana removal spell over it, unless you've got a very synergistic Revolt deck that is very good at enabling Revolt in the opponent's turn. Of course, being an instant has some blowout potential as well. Maybe the opponent tries to kill your creature to set up a good attack, and then you still get to use Fatal Push in the opponent's turn to maybe kill a 4-mana creature. So, yeah, 1 mana is not too difficult to keep up, but uh, sometimes it can be a bit finicky to get the creature you want. Then we have Fen Hauler, 7 mana for a 5-5 insect at common, and it has Improvise. So once again, we can tap our artifacts to help pay for the generic mana cost. 
and Fan Holler cannot be blocked by artifact creatures, so no chumping with servo tokens in other words. I think this is definitely a card that's going to fluctuate quite a bit in value based on how many creatures you have that can generate servo tokens and how many other cheap artifacts you have, but it can be a central finisher in some of those decks, especially if other people don't want it. Uh, probably a C+, and uh, some decks are going to want it quite highly, other decks are just not going to care about it and give it 14th pick. Then we have Fortuitous Find, two and a black for a sorcery, and we can choose one or both between returning an artifact card from our graveyard to our hand and returning a creature card from our graveyard to our hand. So potential two for one. Uh, we're used to seeing these reanimation effects in black, letting us get two creatures back at sorcery speed. And yeah, this is kind of the version we get in Kaladesh. Usually not going to be too difficult to get two things back as long as we have some artifact creatures or vehicles. So yeah, Fortuitous Find, C+, that's usually where these cards end up. And then Foundry Hornet, 4 mana for a 2-3 insect at Uncommon, it flies. And when it enters the battlefield, if we control a creature with a plus 1 plus 1 counter, we can give creatures or opponents control minus 1 minus 1 until end of turn. So this could be a blowout if the opponent's playing kind of the Fabricate token decks with a lot of 1-1 one, one servo tokens. Uh, of course this goes best in the black-green plus 1 plus 1 counter deck. And a 2-3 flyer, you know, is kind of okay, as long as you can get some good value from the ETB effect. If you don't get anything from the ETB effect, it's pretty mediocre. Foundry Hornet, probably just a C+, but it's gonna be amazing in certain matchups. Can also be quite punishing against some of those one toughness creatures in white that we've seen, like the various three ones that are good at crewing vehicles, but are pretty bad when getting minus one, minus one. Foundry's creature, three mana, two one with flying, gets plus one plus so as long as you control an artifact. So a three one flyer for three, pretty nice. You can also crew vehicles if needed. So the turn you play it, if you have a vehicle in play already, it can crew it right away. And then uh, yeah, 3-1 Flyer can deal quite a bit of damage if the opponent doesn't have any Thopter tokens to block with. So I like C, C+, for Screecher. Uh, kind of depends how aggressive your deck is. If you've got a lot of vehicles and want to beat down, this is going to be closer to C+. If you're a more controlling deck, then the Screecher goes down in value. For the Bridge Prowler, 1 mana for a 1-1 one, one Human Rogue at common. When a Prowler enters a battlefield, you may have target a creature get minus one, minus one until end of turn. So this is another one of those cards that can be quite punishing against the various three ones in the set. So even though a three one is very good at crewing vehicles, there are quite a few minus one, minus one effects in the set that can punish them. Uh, that being said, Prowler is mostly going to be a sideboard card, and it's going to be a pretty good sideboard card in some matchups, but still not a card you want to take super highly, so probably just a C. Then we have Fretwork Colony, 2 mana 1-1. One, one. Cannot block, and at the beginning of your upkeep, can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it, and you lose 1 life. So this can be an amazing card if you play it on turn 2, and you're the B town, and you can just keep applying pressure. This is going to get out of hand very quickly. If you're on the defensive, the one life loss definitely adds up. But uh, yeah, assuming you can be somewhat aggressive, the colony can kind of win the game by itself, which is a lot to ask for for a two drop. And then it also has additional plus one plus one counter synergies uh, that we've seen already, a few of them at least. So I like a B for colony. It's definitely kind of a high variance card based on when you draw it, if you draw it early and based on how controlling or aggressive the opponent's deck is. Gifted Aetherborn, 2 mana 2-3 two, Aetherborn Vampire at Uncommon, has Death Touch and Lifelink. So unless you've got a removal spell for it, this is usually going to trade for something pretty big. The Lifelink means it's difficult to race. So yeah, this card's awesome. Double Black, not always the easiest to cast on Curve, but even if you cast it later, it's usually worth it. So I like B for Aetherborn, just a very solid uncommon. A Glint's Leaf Siphoner, 2 mana for a 2-1 Human Rogue at rare, has Menace. When the Siphoner enters the battlefield or attacks, you get 1 energy, and at the beginning of your upkeep you can pay 2 energy and then draw a card and lose 1 life. Siphoner saw a ton of constructed play, 
2 mana for a 2 1 menace means it's not too difficult to attack with it a few times before the opponent manages to put up two blockers. So we can often generate quite a bit of energy with the siphoner, which then translates into more cards. And more cards means maybe find more removal to clear a path for it so it can keep attacking and generate more energy and more card advantage. And you don't even have to attack with a siphoner to get value out of it. If you've got other ways of generating energy, it can kind of just sit there and draw some extra cards. And one life for one card is definitely a bargain I'm happy to uh, to strike here. So yeah, siphoner, I think I'm giving this an A, maybe the low end of A, but this is one of the best two drops in the set, no doubt. Then we have Gonti, Lord of Luxury, 4 mana for a 2-3 Legendary Aetherborn Rogue with Death Touch. And when Gonti enters the battlefield, look at the top 4 cards of your opponent's library. You can exile one of them face down, and then you can cast that card at any time. And you can uh, pay mana as though it were mana of any color to cast it. So we've seen Gonti in Jumpstart already. Makes another appearance here. Awesome card. Always going to be a, a nice 2 for 1, unless you manage to exile 4 lands from the opponent, since you can't play those. But uh, yeah, Gonti often trades for something from the opponent and gets an extra card, so it's kind of a guarantee 2 for 1. And 2-3 Death Touch, you know, very good against those large vehicles as well. So I like A for Gonti. Herald of Anguish, 7 mana for a 5-5 five, five Demon at Mythic. It has Improvise and Flying, so if we've got five artifacts to tap down, we can potentially play it for just double black. And at the beginning of your up, at the beginning of your end step, each opponent discards a card. So the turn you play Herald, if the opponent doesn't have instant speed removal for it, it's already gonna generate value by making the opponent discard. And then for one and a black, you can sacrifice an artifact to give a creature minus two, minus two until end of turn. So another potential sacrifice outlet plays nicely with servo tokens so you can first use them to play your herald thanks to improvise and then sacrifice them to give stuff minus two minus two and yeah every turn that goes by if the opponent can't answer herald they're gonna lose more cards heralds definitely one of the better improvised payoffs and uh, not quite gonna give it an s just because of how tricky it is to play you do need to have a pretty dedicated improvised deck to get it in play quickly but assuming you can get this in play around turn 4, it's going to do a ton of work. So definitely at least an A, but a bit of a build around. Then we have Lift Fast to go with our Die Young. Two and a black for a sorcery. Let's just draw two cards, lose two life, and get two energy. So yeah, nice card draw spell in black. Energy is useful if you've got other payoffs. Thinking of the... Uh, 1-1 one, one Death Touch that can make servos, thinking of Dai Yong, which can maybe take out a larger creature if we've got additional energy. There's definitely no shortage of uh, energy sinks in the set. So the two energy definitely adds up. And then two life or two cards is something we're kind of used to seeing in black. It's not a great deal, but you're usually happy with it if the opponent's not a super aggressive deck. But uh, you can't play too many copies unless uh, the opponent's playing a very slow controlling deck, otherwise the life loss starts adding up. But if you can go turn two, play a, a death touch creature to kind of protect yourself and then turn three, start drawing some cards, then uh, live fast looks a lot better. So I like C plus for live fast, good card, but you can't play too many copies. Lost legacy, I'm just not gonna bother reading. This is just an F. Make obsolete, two and a black for an instant add uncommon. Creatures your opponent's control get minus one, minus one until end of turn. Yet yeah, this being an instant is definitely quite significant since it can totally change how combat goes. Uh, it can kill all servo tokens that the opponent has, so potential uh, of being quite strong against those decks as well. One of those cards that can be a complete blowout under the right circumstances. And in other matchups it might do very little if the opponent has very large creatures. For the most part I think you can get... Uh, quite a bit of value from Make Obsolete since we've seen quite a few one toughness creatures already, plenty of servo tokens. So if your opponent is playing Make Obsolete, you might have to rethink about your Fabricate cards and maybe choose for the plus one counter instead of the servo token. So that's also an interesting card to play against, especially if you've seen it in uh, previous games in best of three. 
but uh, I like C plus for make obsolete. Definitely a tricky card to play around. Marionette Master, six mana for a one three human artificer at rare. Fabricate three, so either a four six or a one three that makes three one one servos. And whenever an artifact you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, target opponent loses life equal to the master's power. So once again you're faced with this interesting decision. Do I want to make my master into a 4-6 and potentially make the opponent lose 4 life with each uh, creature that dies or artifact that uh, goes to the graveyard? Or do I want to make the 3 servos that will help me with uh, enabling the master but then the opponent only loses 1 life? So definitely an interesting card to play with. But assuming you've got kind of some other artifacts uh, like the puzzle knots or implements, those all synergize quite nicely with the marionette master. Uh, then the master could kind of carry a game by itself. Maybe play it as a 4-6 and then sacrifice three random artifacts and the opponent's dead. I like a B, B plus for marionette master and in a very dedicated artifact synergy deck it might even bump up to an A. Malfist Squad, 4 mana for a 3-1 Human Artificer with Menace and Fabricate 1, so 4-2 or 3-1 Menace that leaves behind a 1-1 token and uh, yeah, 4-2 Menace beats down pretty hard and requires multiple blockers, so not that easy to trade off with unless the opponent has some servo tokens laying around so I like, uh, yeah, probably just a C still for Squad just a fine common now this card's quite interesting Midnight Oil, 4 mana enchantment at rare. When it enters a battlefield, it enters with 7 hour counters on it. At the beginning of your draw step, draw an additional card and remove 2 hour counters from Midnight Oil. Your maximum hand size is equal to the number of hour counters on Midnight Oil, and whenever you discard a card, you lose 1 life. So basically, you want to play Midnight Oil when you're almost empty handed because your hand size is going to reduce very quickly. Each turn your maximum hand size is reduced by 2. So if you play this on turn 4, you're going to end up discarding a ton. But if you're almost empty handed and you play Midnight Oil, it's going to start drawing 2 cards per turn. And as long as you can just play out everything you draw, it's going to be great. And you're not going to have to worry about the drawback of the maximum hand size or the drawback of losing life when you discard. So this is going to be at its best in a very aggressive deck that can quickly add to the board and is never going to be stuck with too many expensive cards in hand. So you're not going to want this in any controlling deck whatsoever. So yeah, the, the grade here on Midnight Oil is going to fluctuate wildly based on your deck's composition in a very aggressive deck. This might even go up to a, a B, B+. Plus. In a, a more mid-rangey controlling deck, you're probably not going to want to include this whatsoever. So overall, I'll give Midnight Oil C+, uh, but has a ton of potential in the right deck. Then we've got Mind Rot, 2 and a black for a sorcery to make target player discard 2 cards. Kaladesh can be pretty aggressive when you're staring down a vehicle, so in that case Mind Rot doesn't look great. Mind Rot often fluctuates between like a C and a D. This is probably closer to a format where Mind Rot's going to be a D. Uh, and not exactly where you want to be. Then we've got Night Market Aeronauts, 4 mana for a 2 2 Aetherborn Warrior with flying and revolt, and then it enters with a plus 1 plus 1 counter. So, yeah, never really all that exciting. 4 mana 3 3 flyer is definitely okay, but 4 mana 2 2 flyer is pretty miserable. So, this is just a C, but in the revolt decks, it's definitely playable. Night Market Lookout, 1 mana for a 1-1 one, one human rogue. When it becomes tapped, each opponent loses 1 life and you gain 1 life. So this is perfect for crewing vehicles. You can always just tap it down if you have a vehicle in play to keep draining the opponent for 1 each turn. So that's a great use for it. And if you're an aggressive deck that can curve out and keep tapping the lookout over and over, Sky Skiff is kind of the perfect card to pair with it. Then uh, the damage adds up very quickly. Yeah, the lookout in the aggressive crew decks is going to be quite nice, even a C+. Uh, outside of those very aggressive vehicle decks, it's not where you want to be. So in those decks, you're just never going to take it. So overall, lookout probably a C. That's probably around where you want to take it, but has a lot of upside in the right deck. Then we've got Noxious Gearhulk, another one of the Gearhulks 
And this one is definitely the real deal. Six mana for a 5-4 artifact creature construct at Mythic with Menace. And when it enters the battlefield, you may destroy another target creature. And if a creature is destroyed this way, you gain life equal to its toughness. So this is just a giant a ravenous chupacabra. And 5-4 Menace. You can close out the game in a couple attacks. Destroys the biggest thing in play, gains a ton of life. This is an S, no doubt. Immediate impact and has a lasting effect on the game. Rush of Vitality, one on a black for an instant, giving a creature plus on plus so and a lifelink and indestructible until end of turn. So as far as combat tricks go, this is a pretty good one. It both increases power, lifelink is nice in a racing situation, and indestructible of course can also save a creature from removal. So I like Rush of Vitality as far as combat tricks go. Probably a C, C+, plus, depending on how aggressive your deck is. If you're not really a deck that's putting the opponent into situations where they have to block or double block, it gets a bit worse, but in a very aggressive deck, maybe you're attacking with a 6-6 six, six vehicle, the opponent tries to double block it, then Rush of Vitality is going to be a blowout. Sly Requisitioner is a 4 and a black for a 2-2 two, two human artificer at Uncommon with Improvise, so once again can potentially be played for 1 mana if we tap for artifacts or any, anywhere in between. And whenever a non-token artifact we control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, we get to make a 1-1 one, one colorless servo artifact creature token. I don't recall this being very good. I don't think this made uh, the final cut very often. So yeah, Requisitioner, probably just a, a C, just a random filler card in the improvised decks. Then we have a Subtle Strike, one on a black for an instant. That lets us choose one or both. Creature gets minus one, minus one until end of turn, and put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. So going to be at its best in the black-green plus one counter synergy decks, where you care about the plus one counter. But Subtle Strike is going to be pretty good in any deck that can cast it and has a bit of a board presence with a couple cheap creatures. And uh, yeah, we've seen quite a few 3-1s, so this can potentially take those out and give you a plus one counter. So I like Soul Strike quite a bit, probably C+. Usually prefer this over the previous combo trick we've seen, unless you're a very specific deck. Underhanded Designs, one on a black for an enchantment at Uncommon. And whenever an artifact enters a battlefield under your control, you can pay one mana. And if you do, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. So this can drain the opponent out by itself, potentially. And then for one on a black, we can sacrifice underhanded designs to destroy target creature, but we can only activate this if we control two or more artifacts. So it requires a bit of setup to use the destroy ability, but sometimes you just want to keep this in play to keep draining the opponent. So this is going to be perfect for those kind of black-white, slow, grindy revolt decks, or maybe a blue-black control deck that wants to play a bunch of cheap artifacts or implements. And uh, in those decks it's going to be quite good. So I definitely have uh, some good memories of underhanded designs. And I'm happy giving this maybe a B, B-. Vengeful Rebel, 2 and a black for a 3-2 Aetherborn Warrior. With a Revolt giving a creature minus 3, minus 3 until end of turn. So yeah, the Rebel's pretty good. Enabling Revolt by turn 3 can be a little bit tricky. I think the best case scenario is you're on the draw, uh, both players play a 2-drop, opponent plays a 3-drop, you attack with your 2-drop, they trade off for the opposing 2-drop, and then you can play Rebel to kill the opponent's 3-drop, or something along those lines. So that's probably the best case scenario, but uh, even in the late game you can still get good value out of the minus 3, can maybe enable revolts with your various revolt synergies, your implements, so it doesn't have to be uh, creatures trading off to enable revolt necessarily. A 3-2 at the very least, so even if you're not enabling revolt, the fail case is still not too bad. So I like B for Vengeful Rebel. Then we've got Weaponcraft Enthusiast, 2 and a black for an O1, Aetherborn Artificer at Uncommon with Fabric A2. So it can potentially make 3 creatures for 3 mana, or we can make a 2-3. Probably gonna choose the 2 tokens more often than not. Enthusiast going to be probably at its best in sort of the black-white, go-white token decks, or maybe some sort of uh, blue-black deck that just needs to have some cheap uh, 
artifacts in play for improvise or to potentially sacrifice to various effects. Cannot underestimate how relevant having cheap access to artifacts is in the set, making the enthusiast quite a bit better than it might seem at first glance. So I like C plus for enthusiast. Yahani, Undying Partisan, 2 and a black for a 2-2 legendary Aetherborn Vampire with haste. And whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, we can put a plus one plus one counter on Yahani. And we can sacrifice another creature to make Yahani indestructible until end of turn. So pairs nicely with servo tokens to make Yahani indestructible. Gonna require a bit of setup to make Yahani a bit larger and put those plus one counters on it. But over time, Yahani is eventually gonna get a bit larger and turn into an actual threat worth protecting. So yeah, Yahani is okay. I like B for Yahani. Requires kind of the right circumstances to be amazing. And uh, definitely pairs nicely with her expertise. 4 mana sorcery at rare, giving all creatures minus 3 minus 3 until end of turn. And you may cast a spell with convert mana cost 3 or less from your hand without paying its mana cost. So a nice 4 mana sweeper. And still get to potentially cast something else for 3 or less mana. And probably like a B plus A minus. First up we've got Aether Chaser, 2 mana for a 2-1 human artificer at common with first strike. Makes to energy, and then when it attacks, we can make a 1 1 servo. So, this is part of that common cycle. And yeah, Aether Chaser is definitely one of the better ones. 2 1 first strike can easily get in early. Not too many creatures that can block it profitably. And then those servo tokens can be very useful for improvise or other purposes. So, I like C plus for Aether Chaser, one of the better commons for sure. Aether Torch Renegade, 2 and a red for a 1 2 human rogue at some common. Enters the battlefield and generates 4 energy, and then we can tap it, pay 2 energy to deal 1 damage to a creature. Yeah, we can tap it, pay 8 energy, and deal 6 damage to a player or planeswalker. So it doesn't deal 6 to a creature, but it can deal 1 to a creature. If we get 4 energy when it enters the battlefield, we're only halfway of the last ability. So that one's probably not going to come up a whole lot, but we can potentially deal 1 damage twice to take out 2 1 toughness creatures. So there's quite a few... Uh, ways to punish one toughness creatures here as we've seen in both red and black now. It's going to be quite good in some of the energy synergy decks. Uh, making for energy potentially translates into two servo tokens with the ether chaser we've just seen. So there's a lot to like about the renegade so I'll overall give it a C plus. Build to smash one mana for an instant giving a creature plus or attacking creature plus three plus three until end of turn and if it's an artifact it also gains trample until end of turn. So yeah, this is one of those reasons to potentially use your burn spells before a creature is attacking, so they can't use build to smash to save it. So that's an important one to keep in mind. So in an aggressive red deck with a couple vehicles or other artifact creatures, this is going to be pretty nice overall. Just give it a C, fine combo trick. But not being able to use it defensively is also relevant. Cathartic Reunion, 2 mana for sorcery. As an additional cost we have to discard 2 and then we get to draw 3. There's no real synergies with Cathartic Reunion in the set, just a way to potentially prevent flood in the late game. Uh, it's usually going to be worse than discard 1 draw 2 that we've seen recently, but uh, sometimes still nice to have if you're flooding out a bit. So overall just give this a C. Chandra, Torch of Defiance, this is kind of the centerpiece of Kaladesh when it first came out. 4 mana, Planeswalker starts out at 4 loyalty and has 4 different activated abilities. So can plus 1 to add 2 mana, helping us ramp. Can plus 1 to provide card advantage by exiling the top card of our library. And we may cast that card if we don't deal 2 damage to the opponent. So if we exile our lands, it's guaranteed to deal 2 damage. Uh, minus 3 deals 4 damage to a creature, and then a minus 7 ultimate, which is not too difficult to get to, gives us an emblem saying whenever we cast a spell, the emblem deals 5 damage to any target. So Chandra is an easy S, can completely take over a game, can uh, kill a creature when it comes down, can generate mana, card advantage. The emblem usually just wins the game on the spot. Chandra's Power Helix, 2 mana for an instant, dividing 2 damage among one or two targets, so can take out multiple one toughness creatures, maybe some servo tokens, and can also just deal two damage to one creature instead. So just a nice flexible removal spell. I like C plus for Pyro Helix. Chandra's Revolution, four mana sorcery, dealing four damage to a creature, 
and we can tap target land as that land doesn't untap during its controller next untap step which is just pure upside you're pretty happy with four mana sorcery that deals four damage but can potentially delay the opponent's uh, curve out a little bit so just pure upside yeah c plus for revolution seems okay it is a sorcery so it doesn't tag vehicles but uh, can definitely take out some large creatures combustible gear hulk six mana for a mythic rare artifact creature construct with first strike it's a six six and when the gear hulk enters a battlefield target opponent may have you draw three cards if that player doesn't we mill the top three cards instead and gear hulk deals damage to that player equal to the total converted mana cost of those cards there's definitely some fun constructed decks you can brew up with a gear hulk where you can maybe one hit ko the opponent if they don't let you draw th three cards uh, for limited, the opponent's usually going to decline to let you draw three and maybe take like four or five damage on average, which is still a pretty good deal as you also get a 6-6 six, six first strike. So this one's not as good as the blue gear hulk or the black one, but it's still quite strong, so happy giving this an A. Destructive tampering, three mana sorcery, letting us choose between destroying an artifact or creatures without flying cannot block this turn, and both modes are re definitely relevant. Sometimes you're happy just having a 3 mana way to blow up an opposing vehicle and the second mode can definitely be a nice finisher in an aggressive red deck. So I think tampering is a C plus. Usually you would see this as a sideboard card or kind of a very niche card for aggressive decks. But uh, in, in Kaladesh Remastered I think this is easily main deckable material for red aggressive decks. So C plus seems appropriate. Next up we have Enraged Giant. 6 mana for a 4-4 four, four Giant at uncommon with improvise trample and haste so once again want to play this in those aggressive red decks with a bit of artifact synergy that's why cards like ether chaser are so important being able to make one or two servo tokens means we can potentially get uh, improvised cards in play a turn or two sooner which can make a huge difference so enraged giants pretty nice uh, improvise finisher here um, still a little bit expensive but as long as you've got the cheap artifacts to go with it, I like C plus for Enraged Giant. Then we've got Fateful Showdown for mana instant at rare. Deals damage to any target equal to the number of cards in our hand. And then we discard all the cards in our hand and draw, and draw that many cards. So it kind of refreshes our entire hand and we get to deal a bit of damage. You don't always want to discard your hand when you cast this. Yeah, sometimes you won't be able to kill larger things if you've already cast a few cards, so the timing can be a little awkward. Yeah, not a huge fan of the showdown, but it's definitely playable. So probably like a C, C+. Free Jam Regent, 6 mana for a 4-4 Dragon at Rare with Improvise and Flying. This was one of the better Improvise finishers. Can potentially play it for just double red if we tap down for artifacts. And then for one in a red, the Regent gets plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. So it can just very quickly end the game with just one or two attacks. So I like uh, an A for the Free Jam Regent. You do have to build around it to get it in place sooner. But even if you're just casting this for like 5 mana, tapping down one artifact, it's definitely above the curve. Frontline Rebel, 2 and a red for a 3-3 Human Warrior. And attacks each combat if able. So... The good thing about Rebel in Kaladesh is, of course, vehicles. If it doesn't line up properly, you can always decide to just crew a vehicle, even if the vehicle doesn't attack. You can kind of tap it down to prevent it uh, suiciding. So as long as you've got a few vehicles to tap down your Rebel, it should be okay. 3 mana, 3-3. Three, three. It's not something red gets every time. And uh, yeah, attacks quite nicely early on. So with enough vehicles, this probably goes up to a C+. Plus. On average, probably closer to a C. Furious Reprisal deals 2 damage to each of 2 targets, so we can't deal 4 damage to 1 target. It has to be 2 separate targets, uh, which doesn't always line up the way you want to, but other times this is just a clean 2 for 1. has its awkward moments, uh, but overall still okay. So I think I'm giving this a C. It's kind of like a bigger version of the Pyrohelix. It is sorcery speed. Uh, as opposed to Pyrohelix being an instant. But uh, yeah, can definitely be nice if it lines up properly. Maybe you can use this in your second main phase after attacking to finish off some larger creatures. Overall, give it a C. 
Harnessed Lightning, one on a red for an instant and uncommon. Choose target creature, you get three energy, and you can pay any amount of energy to deal that much damage to that creature. So if you've got more energy, you can take out larger creatures. If you're taking out a smaller creature, you get some free energy left over. Yeah, Hardness Lightning was great, saw a ton of playing constructed as well in the various energy decks, and I'm happy giving this a B. Hijack, one and double red for a sorcery, so there's our Act of Treason of the set. Gain control of target artifact or creature until end of turn, untap it and it gains haste. So being able to steal an artifact means we can potentially steal a vehicle as well. And yeah, in the red-black sacrifice deck, it can potentially work out quite nicely if we can sacrifice the stolen creature or artifact before we have to give it back. So I like a C for hijack, but in the red-black sacrifice decks, this is going to go up in value dramatically. Hungry Flames to an red for an instant at uncommon deals 3 damage to target creature and 2 damage to that player or planeswalker. Just a very efficient removal spell, 3 damage at instant speed, and uh, even get 2 damage to a player as well, so this is also one of the better removal spells in a set. I like B for Hungry Flames. Indomitable Creativity, X and triple red for a mythic rare sorcery, destroys X, target artifacts and or creatures. And for each permanent destroyed this way, its controller reveals cards from the top of their library until an artifact or creature card is revealed, exiles, it, exiles that card, and then we put all the exiled cards on the battlefield. So pretty weird card. Uh, this is kind of a janky polymorph effect for constructed. I don't think you're going to play this in limited very often. Give this a D. Inventor's Apprentice, a 1 red mana for a human artificer at uncommon, and it's a 1-2 that gets plus 1 plus 1 as long as you control an artifact, so it shouldn't be too difficult to have this be a 1 mana 2-3. So a nice aggressive creature for the red decks, and uh, yeah, just good to have on turn 1 to start beating down, and plays nicely alongside vehicles as well. So I like a C, C plus for Apprentice, based on how aggressive your deck is. Invigorated Rampage, one and a red for an instant and uncommon. Choose one between target creature gets plus four plus so and trample until end of turn, or two target creature each two target creatures each get plus two plus so and trample until end of turn. So the versatility here is amazing. So as far as pump spells go, Invigorated Rampage is one of the better ones out there. So I like C plus for Rampage, definitely has some blowout potential. Then we've got Kari Zev, a Skyship Raider, one and a red for a 1-3 Human Pirate, a Legendary, and it has First Strike and Menace when Kari Zev attacks. We also get to make a token named Ragavan, which is a 2-1 Legendary Red Monkey Creature token, and it enters the battlefield tapped and attacking, and it gets exiled at the end of combat. So essentially attacks for 3, very difficult to uh, block Kari Zev early on since it has Menace. So yeah, can get in a ton of damage. Not the best at crewing vehicles, since we can't really use the 2-1 token to crew vehicles. So it's kind of awkward in the set when it comes to vehicles at least, but just a 2-drop that can get in a ton of damage. And uh, when the opponent eventually tries to double block Karizev to take her out, uh, they're still maybe taking 2 damage from the token, and maybe we've got some combo tricks to make sure Karizev survives, which also plays nicely with First Strike. So there's a lot to like about Karizev, happy giving this a B. And Karizev's Expertise is the second Act of Treason effect in the set, although this one's a rare, so we can gain control of a creature or vehicle until end of turn, untap it, gains haste, and then we can also play a card with CMC 2 or less for free. So yeah, this is just a better version of Hijack essentially, so I'll give this one a C+. A Lathnu Sailback, 4 in a red for a 5-4 Lizard, just a vanilla creature, nothing special. This is a D, but sometimes you'll need a curve filler or you don't have any vehicles, so you want a 5-4 instead. But it lines up quite awkwardly against some of the 6-6 six, six vehicles out there. PNLR, 2 in a red for a 2-2 Legendary Human Artificer, enters a battlefield and is joined by a 1-1 Thopter creature token with flying. And for one in a red, an artifact creature gets plus one plus one until end of turn, so it can pump any artifact creature, including the Thopter, or maybe some other tokens we have already, or maybe a vehicle. And for one mana, we can sacrifice an artifact, and then target creature cannot block this turn, which is usually the last thing that will activate to maybe get in for lethal, 
and uh, yeah another sacrifice outlet so plays well with uh, servo schematic for example that we've seen earlier can sacrifice it and still make a 1-1 token that also plays well with pia and yeah just being able to make a 1-1 token right away means that even if the opponent kills pia right away we still got a bit of value so pia yeah might be an a minus b plus at the very least just a very solid card precise strike one mana for an instant and target creature gets plus one plus so and gains first strike until end of turn this is not a very exciting combo trick since it doesn't do a whole lot so this is closer to a d quicksmith a genius two and a red for a three two human artificer adds uncommon whenever an artifact enters a battlefield under our control we can discard a card and if we do draw a card so a nice way to kind of loot away extra lands in the late game, plays well with vehicles, can just use this to crew our vehicles so we don't have to put it in harm's way. So I like C plus for genius, just a fine above average creature. Quicksmith Rebel, 4 mana for a 3-2 human artificer at rare. When it enters a battlefield, target artifact we control gains a very powerful ability since we can tap it and then deal 2 damage to any target for as long as the rebel is in play. So... Yeah, if the rebel survives and we maybe get to take out a two toughness creature right away it uh, can generate a ton of value and then can also just go upstairs so if the opponent doesn't have a creature that we can kill we can just start going upstairs and kill the opponent this might be an a as well definitely uh somewhere between a b plus and an a minus if it doesn't get answered immediately it can run away with the game a ravenous intruder one on a red for a one two gremlin at uncommon and we can sacrifice an artifact to give it plus two plus two until end of turn so this is perfect for the red black sacrifice decks or any red sacrifice deck really since we can just combine this with hijack or carry Zef's expertise to steal the opponent's stuff and uh, yeah plus two plus two adds up pretty quickly so if we've got a bunch of random servo tokens laying around intruder can threaten lethal and unlike the uh, black creature that can only be used at sorcery speed we can use the intruder at any time so makes it very difficult for the opponent to block intruder in the middle of combat if we've got a few artifacts in play so it's definitely a build around card it's not going to be amazing in any red deck but if we've got some uh, artifacts to feed to it it can deal a ton of damage so i like c plus for intruder a reckless fireweaver two mana one three saying whenever an artifact enters a battlefield under our control fireweaver deals one damage to each opponent so this was a fine role player in some of the red decks, especially the ones that uh, play lots of random trinkets that deal damage. This is just a C, fine playable. And also plays nicely with Sky Skiff and the uh, smaller vehicles that can be crewed for just one power. Runa's Gremlin, one mana for a 1-1 one -one Gremlin, and for 200 red we can sacrifice it to destroy an artifact. This one's a little clunky when it comes to artifact removal, and uh, requires four mana total before we can destroy an artifact so not a huge fan of this one just give it a d then we've got salivating gremlins two and a red for a two three gremlin at common and whenever an artifact enters a battlefield under our control the gremlins get plus two plus two and trample until end of turn so this is for each artifact that enters a battlefield so we can potentially enable that ability multiple times in one turn if we've got uh, lots of artifacts entering so yeah that can get out of hands pretty quickly too so i like c plus for the gremlins definitely one of the better red commons scrapper champion for mana for a 2-2 human artificer at uncommon has double strike enters the battlefield and generates two energy and when a champion attacks we can pay two energy to put a plus one plus one counter on it so by itself it attacks as a 3-3 with double strike which is quite powerful and uh, yeah it's only gonna keep on growing if we have other sources of energy to go with it so champion gets a c plus b minus from me depending on how many other energy sources you have if it, this is the only energy source then it's probably closer to c plus but if you've got ways to keep it growing and potentially turn into an even bigger double striker it can uh, totally take over a game by itself all right, so next up we've got Siege Modification, one and double red for an enchantment aura at uncommon. Enchants a creature or vehicle, and as long as the enchanted permanent is a vehicle, it's also a creature in addition to its other types. So this can kind of animate one of our vehicles so we no longer have to crew it each time. And then the enchanted creature gets plus three plus so and has first strike. 
So this is definitely putting all your eggs into one basket, hoping the opponent can't remove your creature. But uh, yeah, it can definitely deal a ton of damage by itself. And if the opponent doesn't have an answer at the ready, it can kind of take over the game by itself. Overall, I'm not a huge fan of this effect, but I'll admit I've definitely lost to it before. I'll give this a C. Then we've got Skyship Stalker, 4 mana for a 3-3, Dragon at rare, it flies, and has a bunch of activated abilities for red mana, giving it plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn, can gain first strike until end of turn, and can gain haste until end of turn. So yeah, the Skyship Stalker has a lot of useful abilities. The more into red we are, the better it gets, because then we can activate the ability multiple times. Yeah, this probably gets an, an A- minus at the very least. Just a big flying threat that can close out the game by itself, even if it's a little bit pricey to use the activated ability. And if you're not mono red, it might be difficult to give it plus one plus zero multiple times in the same turn. But the first strike means that it's virtually impossible for the opponent to block it in the in the air at least. Speedway Fanatic. Two mana for a 2-1 human pilot at uncommon. It has haste, so by itself it can potentially get in for two. And when the Fanatic crews a vehicle, that vehicle also gains haste until end of turn. So any future vehicles we play, we can potentially attack with right away. So just the mere presence of Speedway Fanatic on the battlefield is going to make it very scary for the opponent in case uh, we play out any large vehicles. Yeah, what do we give... Uh, Speedway Fanatic, I think I like C plus for it, but uh, in a vehicle focused deck it might even go to a B minus. Next up we have Spireside Infiltrator, 2 and a red for a 3-2 human rogue at common, and when the Infiltrator becomes tapped it deals 1 damage to each opponent. So this is very similar to the Night Market Lookout that we saw in black. This is just kind of the bigger version, so this is very good at crewing some of the larger vehicles and still deal damage to the opponent. So, yeah, in a vehicle-focused deck, there's a lot to like about Infiltrator. Give this a C+. Sweatworks Brawler, 3 and a red for a 3-3 Human Artificer at common, and it has Improvise and Menace. So this is one of the common Improvise payoffs in red. If we can quickly play some 1 and 2 mana artifacts, we can potentially play this on turn 3. And then, yeah, 3-3 three, three Menace on turn 3 is pretty efficient. And... Uh, it's gonna make it difficult for the opponent to block. So I like C plus for Brawler, definitely have some good memories of this. A Welding Sparks, 2 and a red for an instant, at common, dealing X damage to target creature, where X is 3 plus the number of art artifacts you control. So by itself just dealing 3 damage is great, but it scales nicely with the number of artifacts we control. So yeah, there's a lot to like about Welding Sparks, probably give this a C plus, B minus. Maybe not quite as good as Hungry Flames, the one that dealt 3 damage and then 2 damage to the opponent as well, but there are definitely situations where you would prefer Welding Sparks if you need to take out a larger creature. First green card, Appetite for the Unnatural. We've got 2 and a green for an instant that can destroy an artifact or enchantment and we gain 2 life, so... As far as main deck disenchant effects go, this is definitely a good one. The life is a nice bonus, and there's no shortage of artifacts and enchantments worth killing. So I like C plus for appetite, definitely a main deckable card. Next up we've got Arborback Stomper, 5 mana for a 5-4 beast at uncommon. And it tramples and gains 5 life when it enters the battlefield. This card's great, the life gain is... Definitely a nice uh, addition as well, but just 5-4 Trample is already quite good. So what do we give Stomper? Might even be a B here. Just a very efficient creature with an immediate effect when it enters the battlefield, so definitely doesn't mess around. Armorcraft Judge. 3 and a green for a 3-3 Elf Artificer at Uncommon. And when the Judge enters the battlefield, we get to draw a card for each creature card we control that has a plus one plus one counter on it. So this is a nice payoff for the black green plus one plus one counter decks. Plays nicely with all those uh, other creatures we've seen that can maybe pay energy to get a plus one plus one counter. So yeah, the judge is uh, definitely a card you want to look at as soon as you've got a few plus one counter synergies as a nice way to refuel 
So I like C plus for the judge, but in the right deck it can be closer to a B. A tune with Aether, gonna see plenty of constructed play as well as a one mana sorcery. Lots of search for a basic land and then also adds two energy. So very important for the various energy decks, can help us fix our mana as well if we are base green. So awesome card and uh, yeah, a lot better than it looks because two energy could represent a whole uh, servo token for instance. So those small advantages definitely add up. So I like C plus for a tune with Aether, definitely a high pick. Blossoming Defense, one mana instant, at uncommon, gives a creature plus two plus two and hexproof until end of turn. So perfect for protecting a key creature from removal, but plus two plus two for one mana is still a relevant pump spell. So as far as pump spells go, this is one of the better ones out there. So I like C plus for Blossoming Defense. Bristling Hydra, 4 mana, 4, 3, Hydroid Rare, enters the battlefield and generates 3 energy, and we can pay 3 energy to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it, and it also gains Hexproof until end of turn. So very difficult for the opponent to kill, as long as we keep up 3 energy. And uh, yeah, 4, 3, 4, 4 is not a bad deal. This was also a key part of the energy deck in Constructed, so an awesome limited card as well. Happy giving this one an A. Commencement of festivities, one on a green for an instant, essentially just a fog effect, prevent all combat damage that would be dealt to players this turn. So doesn't prevent damage dealt to creatures, only prevents damage dealt to players, which is definitely different, since you can potentially still kill some creatures in combat. This is not an effect you're very interested in, so I'll give this a D. Creeping Mold, to a double green for a sorcery at uncommon, can destroy an artifact, enchantment, or land. Now, this is a little bit pricey as far as disenchant effects go, so I would much prefer Appetite for the Unnatural over this, even if this has the utility of destroying a land, but it's just not super relevant and limited most of the time. So I'm giving this a D, but every now and then you might cite this in if you don't have other disenchant effects and the opponent has some important artifacts or enchantments that you need to take out. A Druid of the Cowl, one and green, for a 1-3 elf druid that taps to add a green mana, so nice mana elf at common. So yeah, this card's awesome. One of the better green commons for sure, and a 1-3 also blocks all those random 2-1 first strikers and other 1-1 tokens we've seen. So plays defense nicely and ramps, so I like C plus for a druid. A green belt, a rampager, single green for a 3-4 elephant at rare. When it enters the battlefield, pay two energy, and if we cannot pay two energy we have to return it to our hand, and we get one energy. So let's say we have double green mana, turn one we can play Rampager, make one energy, turn two, play it, get another energy, and then play it a third time, and then it will stick around as a 3-4. But the Rampager also has some other neat applications. First off, it's a great way to enable a revolt for just one mana. Since we'll play it, it will go back to our hand, so it counts as a permanent leaving the battlefield. So that's a great way to enable Revolt. It also potentially can be used to generate energy. Let's say we have another card that can potentially pay to energy to use some sort of effect. Then we can just play the Rampager to add one energy each time and kind of use it as an energy producer instead. So there's a lot of neat synergies with a Rampager, and sometimes it's just a 3-4 that we can play if we had some spare energy from a previous card. So there's a lot to like about the Rampager. Overall, probably give this a B. Heroic Intervention, one on a green for an instant at rare, giving permanence we control hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. Yeah, typically people tend to overrate this card. It's definitely powerful when it lines up correctly, but it doesn't always line up correctly and just ends up being a two mana combo trick and sometimes it's even worse because it doesn't increase power or toughness. So I'll settle on a C plus for heroic intervention, but uh, I wouldn't take it super highly. High Spire Artisan, two and a green for an O3, Elf Artificer at common, has reach and fabricate one, so it can be a 1-4 or it can be an O3 that makes a 1-1 one -one token. Now with this one, you'll rarely be satisfied with an O3 defender since it just doesn't do all that much, doesn't even prevent opposing tokens from attacking. So this one you'll probably make it into a 1-4 more often than not, unless you're the green-white go-white token deck, in which case the artisan doesn't have defenders, so it can attack, 
and potentially be pumped by a plus two plus one effect. Um, that being said, it's not an exciting card, probably just a C. There's not that many flying cards you need to worry about. High Spire Infusion, one on a green for an instant, giving a creature plus three plus a three until end of turn, and you also get to energy. So the energy is a nice bonus. Two mana for that effect is definitely okay. So if you're looking for a pump spell, this will do. This is just a C. Hunt the weak, four mana for a sorcery at common, letting you put a plus one plus one counter on a creature, and that creature fights target creature you don't control. So we're going back to actual fight effects after seeing a bunch of rabbit bites and ram throughs in previous sets. So you have to be careful that your creature doesn't end up dying in the fight, since it's going to take a bit of damage. But overall, Hunt a Week is usually one of the better commons in green, so fluctuates between a C plus and a B. Uh, I'll start out with a C plus for Hunt a Week, and we'll see how it plays out. Then we've got the Seed Sculptor, one and a green for a one to elf druid. When it enters a battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. So we've seen plenty of these similar effects. Usually they're stapled onto two mana one ones that can, can put a plus one counter somewhere. This is a little bit better as a one two, so it can potentially be a two mana two three, or it can be a one two that puts a plus one counter somewhere else. So this is going to be at its best in the black green plus one plus one counter synergy decks. Um, yeah, I like C plus for Seed Sculptor, just a fine playable. And the 1 2 can also block servo tokens quite nicely. Lifecraft Cavalry, 4 and a green for a 4 4 Elf Warrior at common. It tramples and revolts, lets it enter the battlefield with 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. So that's definitely a big difference between a 4 4 trample or a 6 6 trample. So this is one of the better revolt payoffs at common. And overall, I'll give Cavalry a C plus, as long as you can enable Revolt consistently. And if you're on the opposing side, you'll always have to be careful if the opponent has 5 mana and is playing green, that you don't trade off a creature to give the opponent Revolt for free. A Long Tusk Cub, we meet again. One on a green for a 2-2 cat at Uncommon. When it deals combat damage to a player, we get 2 energy, and we can pay 2 energy to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. So this is kind of the definition of a card that can snowball out of control as soon as it gets to hit the opponent. If we've got other sources of energy, we can make sure the cup can keep attacking, and this can kind of just take over a game by itself. So Long Tusk Cup saw a ton of constructed play as well. Very powerful card, and uh, of course gets better the more other sources of energy we have. Overall, I might be giving this an A, just uh, one of the most efficient two drops out there that can totally carry a game by itself. Malfist Revolutionary, one and double green for a 3-3 hu human warrior at uncommon. It tramples and when it enters a battlefield or dies, for each kind of counter on target permanent or player, give that permanent or player another counter of that kind, so it can potentially give additional energy or plus one counters. And you know, a 3 mana 3-3 three, three trample is not too bad by itself, so a double green makes it a little bit more difficult to cast than I would like. But overall, it's still pretty decent. Um, yeah, this is like between a C plus and a B minus. Probably end up on a C plus for this. A monstrous onslaught, three and double green for a source rate uncommon. Deals X damage divided as you choose among any number of target creatures, where X is the greatest power among creatures you control as you cast it. So it does require a bit of setup if you don't have a large creature in play. Onslaught's not going to do anything. But uh, assuming you've got a large creature, maybe a vehicle that you can crew before playing this, then Onslaught can be a pretty powerful removal effect. So I like C plus for the Onslaught, just because it can be a little bit conditional, and sometimes you're just not going to be able to cast it. Narnum Renegade, one mana for an Elf Warrior at Uncommon. It's a 1-2 with Death Touch and Revolt, gives it an additional plus 1 plus 1 counter. So 1-2 Death Touch is already decent, especially when facing large vehicles. And every now and then it's going to be a 2-3, so it can start beating down a little bit better. Because the thing about Death Touch creatures is the opponent might not want to block them, but if they're only taking 1 damage per turn, they can usually take quite a few beatings. But uh, yeah, if this is a 2-3, it can actually apply a relevant amount of pressure. So I like C plus for Narnum Renegade. 
Nature's Way, one on a green for a sorcery at uncommon. Target creature you control gains Vigilance and Trample on turn of turn, and it deals damage equal to its power to target creature you don't control. So this is more like the Rabbit Bites we're used to. So this one I kind of like more than Hunt a Week, just because you don't risk losing your opponent in the fight. And being only 2 mana is also much cheaper, and uh, Vigilance and Trample is just a nice bonus. So I like B for Nature's Way. Then Nissa Vital Force, yet another Planeswalker. 5 mana for a 5 loyalty legendary Nissa Planeswalker. Can plus 1 and then untap target land. And until our next turn it becomes a 5-5 five, five elemental creature with haste. It's still a land. The minus 3 returns a permanent card from our graveyard to our hands, so can potentially provide card advantage right away. And the minus 6, which we can get to after just 2 turns, gives us an emblem saying whenever our land enters a battlefield under our control, we can draw a card. So definitely remember making plenty of Nissa Vital Force emblems. And uh, yeah, this card is pretty strong. Can uh, turn something into a 5-5, five, five, so it kind of protects Nissa by itself, just using the plus 1 ability. And then you can very quickly ultimate and get a nice card draw engine. So Nissa Vital Force... Is this worthy of an S? It doesn't have built-in removal, that's kind of the main problem, so if you're very far behind, maybe the opponent has some flying creatures out, Nissa's not necessarily the answer to the problem. But if the board is stable, this is definitely going to pull you ahead, and if you're behind, it can still make a 5-5 blocker, which sometimes is good enough. Yeah, I might be giving this an S. It's definitely borderline, not as convincing as, let's say, Sky Sovereign, but uh, yeah, it's still definitely a powerful Planeswalker. Ornamental Courage, 1 mana for an instant. That untaps a creature and gives it plus 1 plus 3 until end of turn. Not an exciting combat trick, but definitely one you need to keep in mind. Because uh, not every set has combat tricks that untap creatures. So this is one of those. So if the opponent has a green mana left over, just double check that you're not going to get destroyed by Ornamental Courage. And uh, yeah, overall this is just a D on the low end of combo tricks. Then we've got Ovia Pashri, Sage Lifecrafter, single mana for a 1-2 legendary human artificer, add rare with a bunch of activated abilities. For 3 mana we can tap it to make a servo token, and for 5 mana we can tap it to make an XX construct token, where X is the number of creatures we control. So yeah, Ovia just takes over a game by herself if she goes unanswered and makes for a great mana sink. 1-2 is quite vulnerable, so pretty much any removal will take her out. But it does require an answer, otherwise it's just gonna win the game. So I like a B for Ovia. Pima, Aether Seer, 3 and a green for a 3-2 Elf Druid at Uncommon. When it enters a battlefield you get energy equal to the greatest power among creatures you control. So by itself the Seer could generate 3 energy if the opponent doesn't kill it in response. And then we can pay 3 energy and then target creature blocks this turn if able. So it can force the opponent into some awkward situations. Although I do want to point out that if the opponent has a vehicle in play, let's say they have a valuable creature that you want to kill, you use the ability, then the opponent can still decide to tap their creature to crew a vehicle. And then, of course, that creature is not going to be able to block, and it can kind of prevent you from getting value from your Aether Seer. So that's a pretty important interaction to keep in mind. That makes this card a bit worse than it might be in other formats. So I think I just give this a C+. It's probably just a 3-2 that generates a bunch of energy, and occasionally you're going to use the ability. But for the most part, it's just a way to generate energy for your other cards. Pima Outrider, 4 mana 3-3 three, three Trampler with Fabricate 1, so it can be a 4-4 four, four Trampler or a 3-3 three, three that makes a Servo Token. Yeah, definitely just a fine common C plus for Outrider. And then a Rich Scale Tusker, now this was one of the better uncommons in the set. 5 mana for a 5-5 five, five Pangolin Beast, and when the Tusker enters the battlefield put a plus one plus one counter on each other creature we control. So this can be an absolute blowout if you're going wide with a bunch of tokens, but under most circumstances this is going to be great. Also keep in mind, when you play the Tusker, let's say you have a vehicle, um, but the only way to crew it is with the Tusker itself, you can still respond to the ETB effect from Tusker, 
crew your vehicle and then your vehicle will also get a plus one plus one counter before the ability resolves. So that's also an important interaction to keep in mind. I like an A for Rich Gale Tusker. This is just a bomb. A Riparian Tiger, 5 mana for a 4-4 cat at common. It tramples, generates 2 energy when it comes into play. And when it attacks, we can pay 2 energy to give it plus 2, plus 2 until end of turn. Yeah, just a solid creature, plays well in the energy deck. And you're usually happy to have a couple of these to top out your curve. So C plus for Riparian Tiger. A Rishkar Pima Renegade, 2 and a green for a legendary elf druid at rare. It's a 2 2, and when a Rishkar enters a battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on each of up to two target creatures, potentially including a Rishkar himself. And each creature you control with a counter on it has the ability to tap for green mana, so potentially double ramps us. So, very powerful card, plays quite nicely with all the plus one counter synergies. I like an A for Rishkar has a lot of potential, especially if you've got some expensive cards in the deck. And then Rishkar's Expertise, 6 mana sorcery at rare, lets us draw cards equal to the greatest power among creatures we control, and then we can cast a spell with convert mana cost 5 or less for free. And that's a great way to kind of complement our expertise, since we can draw extra cards and then potentially uh, put one of those extra cards in play for free. So great synergy with the extra ability, unlike some of the other expertises where it's maybe less relevant. And uh, yeah, if you've got a large vehicle, make sure to crew it before casting your Rishkar's expertise so you get to draw more cards. Uh, yeah, overall, expertise requires a bit of setup in the sense that you do need a large creature in play, so it doesn't necessarily do it by itself, but we've seen plenty of large creatures in green, and uh, there's also lots of large vehicles out there. So I like B+, plus A- minus for Rishkar's expertise, Requires a bit of setup, but usually will take over the game if it uh, resolves with like a four or more powered creature in, in play. Then Sage of Shayla's Claim, two mana for a 2-1 Elf Druid at common. When it enters the battlefield, you get three energy. So this is purely an energy enabler. 2-1, not too exciting by itself. But if you've got other energy payoffs, this could be worth it. This is just a C. Wasn't an incredibly exciting card, but some of the energy focus decks were pretty happy with it. Also plays nicely with a module that lets you pick up creatures again if you're just interested in making energy. Servant of the Conduit, on the other hand, 2 mana for a 2-2 two, two Elf Druid at Uncommon. Generates 2 energy, and we can tap it and pay an energy to add 1 mana of any color. So this is a great way to ramp. 2 mana 2-2 two, two as a fail case isn't bad, and make, making 2 energy for other energy payoffs is always nice. So Servant gets a C plus, B minus from me. Um, between this and Druid of the Cowl, I would usually take this, but there's definitely situations where you would prefer Druid of the Cowl being able to make mana without having to pay energy. Thriving Rhino, 2 and a green for a 2-3 Rhino at common, part of the Thriving Cycle, and it enters a battlefield generating 2 green mana, or let me rephrase that, when it enters a battlefield we get to add 2 energy, and when the Rhino attacks, we get to spend 2 energy to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. So it can attack as a 3-4 three, for four, 3 mana, which is no joke. And the more energy we have, the more we can keep growing our thriving Rhino. So this is also one of the better commons that can very quickly get out of hand. So I like C plus for thriving Rhino. Also pairs nicely with the Eddie Trail Hawk that we saw in white to potentially give it flying so it can keep attacking. Then we've got Unbridled Growth, single green for an enchantment aura. And the enchanted land that we're going to enchant can then add one mana of any color. And we can sacrifice a growth to draw a card. So the mana fixing aspect of growth isn't super important. It's mostly a way to enable revolt, since we can play it early and then at some point sacrifice it to draw a card. So we didn't lose any card advantage and we got to enable revolt. So that's the main purpose of this card. So in the Revolt decks, you're going to take this pretty highly. Outside of those, you don't really care about it too much. So this is probably just a C. Then we've got Verger's Gearhulk. Also one of the better Gearhulks for Limited at the very least, but might also see some plain Constructed now with Winding Constrictor. 5 mana for a 4-4 Mythic Rare Artifact Construct. And uh, it tramples, and when it enters the battlefield, we can distribute four plus one plus one counters among any number of target creatures we control. 
So by itself it could be a 5 mana 8 8 trample if we don't have any other creatures in play. But usually you want to spread around your counters a bit in case the opponent has removal. But yeah, 8 power and toughness with trample for just 5 mana is a definitely a pretty nice deal. So yeah, Virgis Gearhulk might get an S as well just because of how impactful the card is. Wild Wonder, 4 mana for a 3-2 Elf Druid at common. When it enters the battlefield, lets you search your library for a basic land card and put it on the battlefield tapped. So this is nice if you're trying to splash some cards or if you're ramping into something big. And then a 3-2 can still potentially crew vehicles as well, so a nice card, give this a C+. But uh, you're probably only going to want this if you're building some more adventurous uh, multicolor decks that are doing some dirtly things that require a lot of mana. And then Wildest Dreams, double X and green for a sorcery at rare, and lets you return X target cards from your graveyard to your hand and then exile Wildest Dreams. So this is an awesome card in the more grindy matchups. If you've got a full graveyard, this will usually help you take over the game. Can get back any cards, including other instants and sorceries, so can get back removal as well. But yeah, some matchups, you're just not going to have time to cast it, or the opponent's just playing an aggressive deck and it's going to run you over, and then it's not going to be great. But in a kind of a typical matchup that's more mid-range and a bit more grindy, it's definitely going to pull its weight, so I like B for Wildest Dreams. First land is Aetherhub, enters a battlefield and generates one energy, can tap it for colorless mana, or pay one energy and add one mana of any color. So pretty nice in any energy deck just to get that free energy and then hopefully we don't have to use Ether Hub too often to fix our mana but can also potentially come in handy for trying to splash and is also going to be an important part of any constructed decks built around the energy mechanic. Those are easily going to play four copies of Ether Hub just to get the free energy. So overall what do we give Ether Hub? Probably a C plus. Definitely a nice card to have unlimited. Then we've got the Cycle of Fast Lands. We'll give these one rating for all of them. And there's a five total, I believe. Blooming Marsh, Spire Bluff Canal. We've got um, the Inspiring Vantage, uh, I believe is the red-white one. Might be mixing things up here. I guess we'll go over them in a, in a second here. So Blooming Marsh, the black-green fast land, enters untapped as long as we control two or fewer other lands. So the first three lands including uh, Blooming Marsh, will be untapped. So, yeah, nice bit of mana fixing in the two-color decks. In Limited, you're typically going to hit land drops for plus more often than in Constructed. So these are a little bit worse in Limited than they might appear, but they're still quite good and you'll take them highly if you're especially those two colors. So I like B for all the fast lands here. So we've got Blooming Marsh, Botanical Sanctums, the blue-green one. We've got Concealed Courtyard in black whites, Inspiring Vantage, red white, and uh, Spire Bluff Canal is the blue-red one, just to go over all of them. And then we have two lands left here, I believe. Inventor's Fair, a legendary land at rare. At the beginning of your upkeep, if you control three or more artifacts, you gain one life, which is definitely not negligible. Not too difficult to meet that requirement. And then only makes colorless mana, but we can also pay four mana and sacrifice Inventor's Fair to search our library for an artifact card, put it into our hand, but we can only activate this if we control three or more artifacts. So not every deck is going to want this, but in some of the more focused improvised synergy decks, for instance, Inventor's Fair could be quite nice at gaining life and eventually turning into an actual card. So it makes for a nice mana sink. Could also see some plain constructed artifact decks. Definitely thinking of uh, some of those colorless ramp decks are easily going to play at least one Inventor's Fair. So yeah, definitely powerful land, and I'll probably rate it around a B for limited. And then Spire of Industry, also going to be an important piece in the constructed mana bases of any artifact decks, and uh, taps for colorless, and we can tap it and pay one life to add one mana of any color, but we can only activate this if we control an artifact. For limited, this is going to be around a B as well. Going to be nice, especially for playing some off-color puzzle knots or... Uh, potential implements that you want to be able to sacrifice in otherwise to color deck so the mana fixing there could be useful and then of course in constructed it's going to see a ton of play in any artifact synergy decks and then we've got our spire bluff 
and we're back at the start with Etherflux Reservoir. So yeah, that's gonna just about wrap up our limited set review of Kaladesh Remastered. Again, these ratings are gonna fluctuate as I play the set more. Most of my ratings are based on my experiences playing Kaladesh uh, originally and Aethervolt, but now we've got both sets combined, some cards were omitted, so the format's gonna be a little bit different. Some key cards like Renegade Freighter are no longer here, and that was definitely a very impactful card back in the day. So the format's gonna be a little bit different, so we'll definitely be adjusting some of these ratings as we play the set more. And for any patrons and Twitch subscribers, I'll keep an updated spreadsheet with all these limited ratings as well, in case you want to have the, the latest updates. And uh, yeah, as always, limited ratings, they're just a guideline. Drafting is a lot more than just card ratings, so you'll always be on the lookout for open colors. You need to keep synergies in mind between cards you already have. So don't purely pick cards based on the highest grade, since uh, that's not going to get you anywhere. But uh, yeah, that should be it for our set review. want to thank everyone here for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.